Yes. Mr. Nelly, what's next? I might invite my learned friend, Mr. Sheen, to call Mr. Godkin. Commissioner, the next witness is uh, Philip George Godkin. Actually got a witness, Mr. Shea. He shouldn't be far away, sir. He knows he's on. <laughs> Maybe that's why he's not here, Mr. Shea. <laughs> he's, he's suitably courageous, Commissioner. <laughs> suitably courageous. I'd rather suspect your solicitor should go and find him. Oh, here he is. Mr. Godkin, would you prefer to be sworn or would you wish to make an affirmation? Uh, an affirmation. Yes. Yes, affirm the witness, please. Sure. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Uh, declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole the truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, please, Mr. Godkin. Yes, Mr. Sheehan. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, your full name is Philip George Godkin. That's correct. And yep. your business address is Tower Two, International yep. Towers, uh, Sydney, 200 Barangaroo Avenue. Barangaroo. Uh, yes, that's right. In the yes. state of New South Wales. Yep. Now, you're attending here to give evidence pursuant to a summons, Mr. Godkin? Uh, yes, that's right. Yep. Uh, I tender the summons, which is dated the 8th of March 2018. Exhibit 1.140, summons to Philip George Godkin. Yes. And um, for the purposes of um, this commission, Mr. Godkin, you've prepared, I think, two witness statements, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, the first. Um, uh, they're both dated the 5th of March 2018. The first, which is the longer, um, we might call your general witness statement, um, and it is uh, WBC, forgive me, Commissioner, WBC 900001001. Um, do you have any corrections that you wish to make to that statement, Mr. Gordon? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I tender that, Commissioner, with its exhibits PG1 to PG39. And he affirms its content, does he? Uh, its Shea? contents are true and correct. Uh, yes, yes, they are. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, exhibit 1.141, uh, statement of Philip George Godkin, uh, WBC 900 001 <coughs> And uh, Mr. Gorkin, your second um, uh, concerns um, the transaction involving Mrs. Thiravangadam, mm -hmm. from whom we just heard. Um, are its contents true and correct? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, I tender it, Commissioner, along with its exhibits PG 2, 1 to 26. Exhibit 1.142, uh, Witness statement of uh, Philip George Godkin, WBC 900002001. Thank you, yes. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Yes, Mr. Dinelli. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Godkin. Hi. My name is Albert Dinelli, and I'm one of the council assisting the Royal Commission. Yep. You are currently the General Manager, Specialist Finance Business Bank at uh, Westpac? That's correct, you? yes. Um, and you, in that, that role, um, are responsible for overseeing most aspects of Westpac auto finance it's a business? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, and that business provides finance predominantly um, originated through car dealers? Uh, correct, yeah. And that involves finance to customers for the purchase of new cars? Uh, yes. And your statements that you've, um, uh, that you've prepared for the Commission, they deal with <coughs> um, car loans made by Westpac Auto 
finance business through through dealer intermediaries only. That's the focus of your. That is the focus. Yes. Um, you pro provide, I think, some context about the origination of um, car loans through through dealers um, in your statement. Yes. Um, and you say that the origination of car loans through dealer intermediaries is driven by consumer demand for finance actually at the point of sale. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, yes. Um, and am I right to say that at the point of sale, the customer um, approaches the dealer about purchasing a vehicle, really? That is, they go in to buy a car and the discussion about finance occurs in that context? Uh, in that context, yes. Um, and uh, that's a reason that the deal intermediary manages communications with the customer, even through the loan application or process? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure. That's, that, that's a reason the dealer intermediary manages communications with the customer through the loan application? Sorry. Yes, that's correct. That is, there's not someone from Westpac there? That's correct. It, it's yep. dealt with by, um, by the dealer? By the business manager in the dealer, yes. That's correct. Yeah. An example of which, and we won't use his name, but an example um, of which would be the um, the manager to whom Mr. Avangadam referred. Um, she gave evidence. Yeah, if you yes, you. yes, no, no, no. I, I, I heard her evidence, and, and, and so she referred to the manager who was the person that she spoke to in dealing with the vehicle, but I think there was also a business manager involved um, who was the one that had the conversation with her about the loan. So I think there were two different roles. Yes, and that um, the person that she called the manager was the business manager. Right, okay. Um, and the, uh, is it right to say that um, loans provided by Westpac Auto Finance are currently originated through either St George or Bank of Melbourne? Uh, yes, that's right. Um, there was, for a time, you offered uh, part of Westpac, was th there was another um, brand through which it was offered as well, is that right? Um, so uh, we offer um, the product through um, what we call white label arrangements yes. with manufacturers. Um, um, and continue to do that. So um, some manufacturers, so, so for example, um, you know, Holden or Hyundai or Kia, um, uh, and, and, and we use their brand na name in I the see. offering of finance, but it's, you know, it's our product. And That's right, so the, the, and you are the provider of the finance, Absolutely. that is Westpac. Correct, yeah. Um, and you've given evidence some of which is confidential. I don't want you to, to disclose that which is confidential. But um, I can ask you this, and I'd be grateful for you to um, assist the Commission with an answer to this question. The number of car loans on issue by Westpac by or through dealers in um, 2017 is you know, a very significant number, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. Um, well, well into multiple hundreds of thousands. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yep. Um, and the quantum of funds that's on loan in respect of car loans um, by Westpac or through dealers is similarly a very significant number, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Um, in the multiple billions? Of dollars? Uh, yes. And am I right to say, am I right to say that the overwhelming majority of car loans issued by Westpac um, are those that are issued um, the, those that are initiated by dealers, is that right? The overwhelming majority? Um, yes, very much the overwhelming majority. I, I think that might be your, um, your exact language mm -hmm. without disclosing the exact um, number, but yep. um, you describe it as um, the, over, the overwhelming majority of Westpac auto business finance is done through dealers. Yes. Do you feel able to say publicly where uh, the Westpac car finance business sits in the market generally? Uh, yes, so, um, uh, and, and talking specifically about the, um, the business of um, auto finance through dealer intermediaries, um, then, um, then we are typically number one or number two, so we swap between those two spots. So. Yeah. 
um, it's fair, isn't it, to say that Westpac as a business is, is, is heavily committed to the motor vehicle dealership model and physical point of sale model? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, in, indeed, it's a very profitable part of the business, isn't it? Um, it's a profitable part of the business, yes. Now, you've made a statement in, um, you've made two statements, the second of which you were taken was in relation to Miss um, Theravanga Dam. Um, and you're aware, of course, that she made a statement and you were in, court in the commission while she gave her evidence? Uh, I, I wasn't in the room, but I did see her statement, yes. And her evidence, sorry. And, and you've, you've read her statement? Yes, the 15th of March? Yes. And that was tendered as her evidence? Mm -hmm. And it was supplemented by what she said? Um, and you accept that she entered into a credit contract with St George on the 26th of July, 2012? Um, yeah, yes. Sorry, I don't remember the exact date uh, that she signed. Memory but test, but that yeah. is yeah. that you can take it from me. That's the day she signed it. Yes. Um, and <clears throat> um, in the course of preparing your statement, you've um, reviewed her application and reviewed Westpac's processes in relation to her statement. Yes, I have. And her, her application, I should say. Oh. Um, and you identified, did you not? Um, some issues with um, the application that was made by Ms. Thera Vanga Dam? Yeah, uh, yes, I did. Um, can I go to them, if I may? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm taking you to your second statement, WBC.900.0. Uh, That's for the benefit of the, the operator. Um, but if I can go to paragraph 17. Yes. You're on page? Zero, 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 0005 and page 5 of the statement. And <clears throat> I'm going to take you through, if I may, um, what you identified as the issues with that, that application. The first is um, as you say there, that the application showed that her main source of income at the time was a Centrelink carer's allowance, um, but there was no evidence that the appropriate supporting documentation was obtained to verify the amount. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and the only other income that she disclosed uh, in, um, in that application was $866.66 per month, which was inconsistent with the payslip that was provided? Uh, that's correct, yep. Um, and in any case, that wouldn't have been sufficient on Westpac's processes at the time to, um, to approve that loan? Yes. Um, just dealing with the payslip for a moment, I won't take you to it, but the payslip which for those in the room will have seen we went to in evidence, in, in Ms. Therav Theravangadam's evidence, was for the 19 March 2012 to 1 April 2012. Why was that a problem for the application? Um, it, was, it was too old. I see. <clears throat> and? What was the, the period you would have expected or required? So there's a, the requirement that a, a payslip is not more than, I think it was 90 days old at the time. 90 days was the cutoff. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, it's also the case, is, is it not, that the application stated that uh, Ms. Thera Vangadam had been employed in her then current part time role, um, whereas she was a casual employee? Uh, that's, that was what we gleaned from the, the payslip, yes. I mean, her, her evidence, as you know, um, and as she said here, was that that um, application was filled out by the manager, the person we called the, the manager. Um, when you did your review, um, you also identified an issue in relation to a debt owed to Orange, the, the phone company. Uh, that's correct, yes. Uh, and... Um, and 
what was the um, the problem with how that was dealt with in the application? Um, so I think you find this at 17D mm -hmm. um, that a document was provided in relation to the debt owed to Orange. Yes. So. And um, was that the problem with that? That that didn't constitute proof of payment. Uh, the, the relevant email. Uh, that's yes, no, that's correct. Now, one other thing is that, and the other thing um, that's identified by you is that the application had n <coughs> listed no expenses. Uh, that's correct. Uh, and um, you say that the expenses at the time were benchmarked against what's described as the Henderson Poverty Index. Can you assist the Commission by explaining what that is? Um, it's a, a benchmark for um, uh, living expense. Uh, sorry, living expenses. Um, it, it, it's it's similar to HEM, which I know there's been some conversation about, um, and, and we switched from the HPI to HEM um, at a later time, but it's a similar style of index of expenditure. In particular, does it depend on, or does it vary according to the number in the household? Um, I, I don't know, I'm afraid. It's, it's, it's something that we stopped using some years ago. So we moved to HEM. HEM is certainly something that does uh, yes, uh, vary does. according to numbers of dependents, doesn't it, and whether it's a couple or not a couple? Uh, absolutely, that's right. Uh, these observations you made about uh, the application, can I just understand, were those based on material available to you in uh, the uh, file held by Bank of Melbourne? Uh, largely, yes. Yes, so that and some oh, inquiries. Largely or oh, wholly? Uh, sorry, yes. wholly, yes. Wholly? Yes. And were they documents that were uh, held in the file from the time of application or had some of them been gathered later? What was the position? Um. All, all of the documents that I've seen Sorry, I'm just trying to be as accurate as possible. All the documents I've seen have come from um, that are documents that are held in our origination system. And therefore were documents available uh, at the time of the grant of the loan? That's correct, yes. And the deficiencies that you identify or the problems you identify yep. were therefore problems that, um, to the extent to which they were apparent, uh, were apparent at the time of origination? Um, can I provide an example? So, so, so with the centre link um, document, for example, um, there was no record of that document um, in the system. That doesn't mean that somebody may or may not have seen it at the time but didn't put it in the system. We've got no evidence. Well, all sorts of things might have happened, mightn't they, Mr Godkin? But as far as the origination file was concerned... This is it. No Centrelink verification, old pay slips, casual, not uh, 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 part-time, uh, no expenses, and some unresolved problem with the phone company. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, you go on. So it's your evidence that properly analysed uh, Mr Vengadam would have failed the credit processes having regard to proper respond responsible lending considerations, wouldn't she? Uh, yes. It follows that it's Westpac's position now, excuse me just for a moment, I think the document come down. Um, it follows that Westpac's position is that the car loan should never have been granted in the first place. Um, based, yes. Was any check done at the time of origination? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not... Was any check made at the time of origination uh, about uh, the data or information 
that was supplied? Um, it should have been, yes. Um, by, the, uh, by the credit acceptance officer who would have been approving the loan. Yeah. And is that a process that at that time uh, would ordinarily have left a documentary record of who did it and what they had done? Uh, yes. And did you observe anything on the file? Uh, I don't want you to name the officer concerned, mm -hmm. but did you uh, observe anything on the file to show that a relevant credit officer had made the assessment and ticked it off? Um, so, um, there were uh, two different credit officers who approved this file over the course of a couple of uh, submissions. Um, but yes, sorry, the answer is yes. You've referred to a couple of submissions and uh, that's a, an area about which I know nothing presently, but go on, Mr. Donnelly. <coughs> In relation to what you've... The issue raised by the Commissioner, mm -hmm. can you go to PG2-5, it's WBC.104.001.154, Yes. Uh, this should be redacted, I think. Shouldn't this? Um, John. Uh, can that just be brought down, please? Um, John, John. Um, perhaps it can be just that document can be put up for the Commissioner and for um, Mr. Godkin. I have a hard copy. You've got a hard copy. Does it have the name? It's got the names of the particular people. Um, can it be, if it could be just put up for the commissioner, but not on the screen? We're going to have to confront this question of redactions. The redactions process is not working well at the moment. Now, I'm not seeking to assign blame for it. I'm just saying we're not getting it right soon enough. We're scrambling. Uh, Mr. Sheehan. Uh, yes, no, sir, can I say in relation to this document, I, I answered a question across the bar table from a learned friend wrongly. There's, there's no issue with the redaction of this document. The, the only, in the course of the examination of this witness, there may be a couple of documents where it does arise, and it will only arise because um, we were given notice last night of some additional documents that were to be put to the witness, so we have a an application for rulings that has not yet been determined. But this document won't be a problem, it can go up. Uh, OK, well, if let's go back to I, I WBC 104001548. Before that's put up, and not to cut across my um, learned friend, but it is a matter of his claim for confidentiality, but this is the whole, uh, one of the reasons why the person to whom Ms Thiravanga Dam was on the phone we didn't disclose the name. Um, is because that person's name appears in this document, but um, I don't wish to create a mountain of a, a molehill. Well, that's not. Uh, yeah. Let's put the document up. Uh, this <coughs> document, uh, this document, uh, records, as I understand it, Westpac's internal processes of dealing with. Um, the application to which the Commissioner asked questions previous, uh, about which the Commissioner just asked you some questions, Mr Godkin? Correct. Um, and can you um, assist us by, uh, can you assist us by explaining how this process works within Westpac, the process of using this system? Um. <clears throat> Sorry, the, 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 the system is quite, like I said, our, our entire origination system, so there are multiple parts to it. Okay, well, uh, just these, these document the, doc yeah. the screens that you see up on yeah. the screen now and that form yeah. part of your statement, yes. there is um, a heading, memos for application, um, and then a subject approval conditions. Yes. Uh, can, you, can you assist the Commission by explaining what that process 
um, how that process works? How is it that these matters come to be recorded? Yep. Um, so uh, these will, um, uh, when an application um, comes in, uh, and a credit officer um, reviews that application. Um, uh, these note um, the approval or not, um, depending on um, their assessment. Um, and, and it's here that you might see any conditions of a approval, um, or at least a summary that there are um, conditions. And in relation to Mr. there of Vanga Dam, were there any? Um, there was a condition of approval which related um, to the um, proof that the um, outstanding telecommunications bill um, was paid. I see. Um, and that was one of the issues that you identified as an issue, did you not, with the application process? Um, that's correct. Um, and um, then can I just understand the document? Uh, the condition is in the entry on 2507, is that right? Uh, that, that's correct. And then there's another entry at 30 uh, July approved as submitted. Uh, do I read that as saying uh, the condition is not to be met, has been met? Uh, what, what am I to make of approved as submitted on 30 July. At first blush, I should tell you, I would read it as saying, look, yes, there was a condition, but the condition no longer applies. Go back to the, su the submission as made, and yes, it's OK. Is that what I should read, or should I read something else? Um, so I um, would read that and have read that as um, a, the, the condition has been met. Met. Yes. So here, um, and I'm finished with that document um, for now. Uh, so here we see, am I right to say that this is a process where Westpac went through its processes, no responsible lending issues were raised with the application and it was approved? That's correct. And it's reasonable to say that Westpac's processes in relation to Ms Thera Dam wholly failed to verify Ms Thera Dam's income for the purposes of her application. That's right, isn't it? Uh, on the basis of what we have in front of us, yes. That is... Or is there something else that ought to be in front of us? No. Um, that is very significant, isn't it, that the process wholly failed in relation to her application? Isn't it? It's also a matter that's of significance legally, isn't it? Uh, yes. <coughs> um, if I could call up RCD um, dot O O two two dot triple zero one dot triple zero one. No doubt I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. No doubt you're familiar with, very familiar of course, with the National Consumer Credit Protection Act, Mr Godkin? Uh, yes. Um, so if I could go to point 0099. Uh, paragraph, is it, I'm not taking you to section 128D, but it provides that there are that one must, a licensee, that is relevantly Westpac, must do various things that are stipulated in section 130. <clears throat> in section 130, subsection 1, you see that it says, the life, the, for the purposes of paragraph 128D, thank you, the licensee must, before making the assessment, and I'll take you specifically to 1C, take reasonable steps to verify the consumer's financial situation. You see that? Yes, I do. Um, and that didn't happen in this case, did it? Uh, uh, no, it didn't. 
Uh, and the consequence of that failure was that Ms Thiravenga Dam got a loan that was unsuitable for her, wasn't it? Yeah, we shouldn't have made this loan, that's correct. Um, well, you'll recall that she had to pay $260 per fortnight and she went into default almost immediately, didn't she? Uh, she was in arrears shortly thereafter, yes. Um, and if, if I can take you to another section, just skip ahead to section 133 0104. You are <coughs> no doubt familiar with this section too, which provides for a prohibition on entering or increasing the credit limit of unsuitable credit contracts. Do you see that? Uh, yes. And under section 133 sub 2, it says that, sorry, I should go back a step. First, Westpac under subsection one must not, relevantly Westpac, a licensee must not do various things. That is enter into a credit contract with a consumer who will be the debtor under the contract. And then skipping to the end of the section, if the contract is unsuitable for the consumer under subsection two, do you see that? Yes, I do. And by reason of subsection 2A, this was a contract which was unsuitable, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was. Because it was likely that the consumer, that is Ms Theravanga Dam, will be unable to comply with the consumer's financial obligations under the contract or could only comply with substantial hardship. Yes. Now, in... <coughs> if we could take... You to a document that was prepared at the time that Ms. Theravanga Dam's application was reviewed. So you'll recall, of course, that she got her application, she got her loan in 2012. Yep. She, you've heard her evidence, did her best mm -hmm. to pay it, but mm -hmm. was in arrears, as you've yep. noted from very early on. And uh, she approached um, Bank of Melbourne through lawyers. Um, towards the end of 2017. You're aware of that? Yes, indeed. And then at that time, there was a compliance assessment undertaken, wasn't there? Um, there was a review, yes. Yes. Yep. I, I use the, the language, um, perhaps not the appropriate language, but um, the document is headed that way at wbc.300.003.8 I think it might have, it's an Excel spreadsheet um, that might have to be opened differently. So this, whilst that's um, getting up, being brought up, um, this is what's described as a compliance assessment summary? Yes. What, what is a compliance assessment summary? Um, uh, so, so I've only seen this document just in the last couple of days. Um, yes. But um, uh, this is um, the assessment of um, the um, issue that's been recorded in our incident management system, which is called Juno. Yes. Um, uh, by a, um, the compliance team. I see. Um, and can I... Without going um, to the document, but can I say that um, the column um, dealing with the compliance assessment state, states <coughs> that the root cause of the issue was due to the deficiencies in the credit policy? Did you recall seeing that when you read it? Um, I do recall seeing that. Um, it, it and, and I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I'm unable to pull it up for you. Um, we'll, we'll come to that document um, if we can shortly. But you'll recall that it had those words in it, didn't it? Um, I do recall that.
Now, when before you leave that, can you explain to me what those words mean, or what to what they refer? Deficiency in the credit policy. Um, so, uh, when I saw that, um, which again is just over the last couple of days, I took that to mean um, the application of the credit policy. Because on its face, it seems to be. Uh, uh, assigning as a root cause uh, something much deeper than application, doesn't it? It, it, it does. And Have you looked into uh, that subject? I understand you've only had your attention drawn to the document yep. in the last couple of days. Um, yes, there are limits on time, but have you looked into it at all? Uh, into that particular comment um, with the author, no. Because on its face, uh, it is a proposition of uh, great width mm -hmm. and of possibly no little significance. Yes. But as you sit there, at least at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a point that you are able to uh, deal with other than as understanding it as referring to a deficiency in application of that, credit policy. That is my understanding, yes. That's while I've interrupted counsel, can I just return to a matter about this particular application mm. that provoked it? One of the matters you mentioned in paragraph 17 of your statement in item E was no expenses, but that wasn't a problem. Uh, Henderson Poverty Index was applied, uh, summarising perhaps too briefly, and your words yes. uh, should be preferred to my mm. summary of them. But can I just explore that with you a moment? Because no expenses were listed, you had no idea what this borrower's expenses were, <laughs> did you? That's correct. You had no idea whether, for example, she was caring for someone in the home or elsewhere uh, who uh, required uh, significant expenditures of money uh, for care. That's correct. And so is it right to say that the absence of uh, any, ref any detail of, uh, about expenditure was somehow again, my word, not yours, cured by resort to the Henderson Poverty Index? <clears throat> um, so, so we have, f for the very reasons that you suggest, um, changed our processes to have um, um, both better quality conversation and a better recording of those conversations um, uh, so that we would recognise, for example, special circumstances. Um, the practice at the time um, was... Um, um, less rigorous, and we took the the, the greater of the um, the benchmark that we were using, or the declared expenses. And have, for what period did that practice exist or persist? Yeah. I am the the the, the our approach to. Our approach to this issue has continued to evolve over the last um, some years. I can't give you an exact date, I'm sorry. Can I then come at yep. it this way and again hmm. uh, go to the limits of your knowledge but hmm. not beyond the limits yep. of your knowledge? Uh, when were changes first made? Uh, um, to move away it, from it, it, this? In, a, in around 2015, I'm going to... Yes. More, more substantive changes were made last year. Last year? Hmm. Are you able to say when last year? Uh, so um, significant um, rollout of responsible lending um, training to business managers, which um, talked to some of that some training um, through the middle, early part of the year, some specific system changes which were introduced in August of 2017. Yes. Including amongst other things, mm -hmm. uh, trying to capture better the expenses that the borrower or proposed borrower 
may have. Um, absolutely. So stepping the business manager as they're asking that question is through quite a rigorous process um, and including some very specific questions, for example, about special circumstances. And forgive me for just pressing a little further. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of that, was there any verification of what the business managers reported uh, in the forms that were ultimately submitted? Um, uh, only in uh, generally no. So there were um, some circumstances where that might happen, but generally no. So you were dependent on the accuracy of what the business manager, by that you mean the car yard business manager, yes. do you? You were dependent on the accuracy of what the car bu yard business manager told the company. Uh, that is large, that is mostly correct. Um, so and by, still the by, case. by mostly I mean in the vast majority of cases. Yeah. Um, yes, that's, that's correct. still the case. That is correct. Yes, thank you. <coughs> oh, yeah. One other thing, uh, you said uh, you'd moved away from HPI Henderson Poverty Index to HEM, is that right? Yes, yeah, correct. Uh, is it still the case that if reported expenses are less than HEM, uh, the default is HEM? Uh, that is correct. Yes, I see. Yeah. Now, I really will be quiet, Mr. Donnelly, for a nanosecond. <laughs> Do go on. Thank you, Commissioner. This is the document, and I apologise, it's taken us a little while to get it, but we have. This was a compliance assessment summary done by Jihee Moon, mm -hmm. CCO Business Bank Compliance. Do you know that person? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and he... Uh, she. Sorry. So she, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Ms Moon did uh, that um, assessment on the 14th of December 2017. Why would Ms Moon have done that? Uh, so that will have followed um, uh, the review of the file that followed um, the specific um, a complaint or representation on behalf of the customer um, last year um, and the um, inclusion of that file uh, uh, as an incident in our incident management system, Juno, uh, and then uh, Ms Moon will have um, looked at that um, uh, to assess the um, compliance implications. And, yes. and she said, and I quoted this to you before, but now you'll see it, the root cause of the issue was due to the deficiencies in the credit policy. What I didn't refer to was what's in brackets, that is, rather than mis-selling or error at origination. It seems... It seems to me that that um, suggests that the issue of Ms Theravenga Dam is highlights a deficiency in Westpac's policy, credit policy, doesn't it? Well, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I took this to mean the application of the policy rather than the credit policy. Well, um, I, I think Ms Moon was... So, so the review at the time um, found... Uh, that we didn't do some things that we were um, supposed to do um, and very specifically that relates to the um, income verification. So in the review of the file that was, that was found to be the most significant failing um, in the processing of um, this application and um, uh, so, so my reading of that comment by Ms Moon uh, is that um, we didn't apply the standards that we had for ourselves um, appropriately and we're taking responsibility. So, so we didn't think this was mis-selling. We were saying um, we should have done verification on the income in this case and we clearly, we've got no evidence that we did. That's, that's how I... So the the mis-selling you exclude uh, is uh, to exclude, no, it's someone else's fault. You were saying this was our fault. This was ours. Yeah. Correct. In answer to a question before, you, your evidence was uh, that <coughs> uh, 
that in relation to Ms Theravanga Dam, you, you being Westpac, was dependent on the accuracy of what the car yard business manager told the company, didn't, to which you said yes, that, didn't that's, you? That's correct. Um, and that still is the position, um, your evidence, you, you answered um, immediately thereafter when you said, when it was put to you, um, by mostly I mean in the vast majorities of cases, yes, that's correct, and it is still the case, that is correct. Um, is your answer, is it your evidence that it's still the case that there is uh, dependence by Westpac on the accuracy of the car yard business manager, what it tells the company? Um, so, so if I may, the, the question was quite specifically in relation to expenses, but yes, the answer is yes. Mr Gogkin, the National Credit Act places obligations on Westpac, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. Now, as you well know, mm -hmm. car dealers, and I put this broadly because each car dealer may be different, but generally there is a point of sale exemption, isn't there, in relation to car dealers? The predominance of the dealers that we work with are via an exemption, that exemption, yes. Uh, but insofar as Westpac is concerned, it itself, as a licensee regulated by the National Credit Act, is required to do those things that are stated in, that are prescribed by the National Credit Act, isn't it? Yes, it is. And in fact, it is its responsibility entirely to do those things, isn't it? Uh, ultimately, yes. On the basis, if I could return um, briefly to the section we dealt with a moment ago, um, in fairness to you, so that um, it's, it's before you, it's rcd.002.00, oh, sorry, before I do, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I might tender that if I may, Commissioner, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, exhibit 1.143, Compliance Assessment uh, Summary, WBC 300.003.8179. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, RCD.0022.0001.0001. Um, and if you can go to 0099, please. You recall that I took you to this section and said that Westpac must, before making the relevant assessment, uh, and I took you specifically to sub C, um, but of course you'd be familiar with all of those requirements, make reasonable inquiries about the consumer's requirements and objectives in relation to the credit contract, reasonable inquiries about the consumer's financial situation, and take reasonable steps to verify the consumer's financial situation. The evidence that you've given suggests that Westpac is in breach of section 131C in relation to all of the material that it gets from car dealers, is it not? <coughs> so, I, I can't call it, I'm not qualified to, to, to talk about well, what the legal definition is, the, the position that, that, that we have and the policy that we've got um, is um, that we have um, specific verification standards um, as it pertains to um, income. Um, uh, for um, expenses, we rely on um, the combination of um, the application process and the declarations um, of the customer um, and the business um, manager. Um, and similarly, um, for liabilities, we rely largely on those declarations and any insight that we may glean from a credit bureau report. I'm not asking for a, 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 a legal answer. That mm -hmm. is a question for, for someone else. Yeah. 
uh, and a matter upon which, no doubt, Westpac will make submissions too. But your answer was, as a factual matter, in relation to what you do in your job, mm -hmm. that you are dependent upon the accuracy of what the car yard business managers tell the company. Uh, uh, so, so we are absolutely um, relied on that, but in concert with uh, um, you know, the application form, the declaration from the um, customer. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the question specifically came to the issue of do we separately verify um, expenses and, and the substance of my answer is that in the vast majority of cases we do not. Thank you. you know, just as a matter of human experience and sure. people signing forms in a car <coughs> dealership, <coughs> people signing forms generally, uh, do you have any view on how often people actually read the form they're asked to sign? Um, I, I don't, but I'm sure my human experience is much the same as yours, Commissioner. So. <laughs> I've been careful not to express <laughs> my view, Mr <laughs> Godkin. Uh, uh, I, do you think I'm right or wrong to at least wonder yeah. how often people read the form they're asked to sign? Um, if I... Uh, if I can answer in a slightly different way, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Um, we have um, put in place processes that very specifically step the business manager through a line-by-line -line question um, as it pertains to expenses, and they can't default to zero. They have to actually um, enter a number. Um, we have undisclosed minimums in a couple of key um, expense items um, so that if things are too low, um, like rent and living expenses, it gets referred to a credit officer. Um, for some a assessment, so so that would suggest that that we similarly have some concerns that we need to be vigilant. Sure. And my question was about uh, the customer sitting in the car yard, confronted by a blizzard of forms, the last paragraph of which says, in effect, uh, this is a binding contract, and these are statements that are uh, you are telling us are true. My question is, uh, am I right or wrong to wonder whether people read those? And then the associated question is whether I'm right or wrong to wonder whether, even if they do read them, they understand their significance. What do you think? So my human experience says it's fair to wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Because it bears on what are reasonable inquiries and reasonable verifications. I understand. Yeah. Can I ask you a few questions about the nature of the car loans that are offered by Westpac, if I may? Please. The car finance product that's offered is by way of a fixed rate loan agreement, isn't it? Uh, that's correct. And the key features of that product, I think you set out in your, uh, in your statement, but I'll also take you, if I may, to PG116, document ID for which is WBC.104.001.783. Um, this document, of course, is the Automotive Finance Lending Credit Policy, Consumer and Business of St George. Uh, yes, it is. Just for my benefit as I go through these documents, some of the documents that we've referred to as St George and some of Bank of Melbourne and even Ms Thera Vangadam had dealings with both. Is there any relevant difference that I need to be aware of? No difference at all. I'll Thank you. Brandon. If one goes to 7850 of that document, there's an overview of um, the product features and it, I, I see there that the minimum finance amount is $5,000, maximum is $250,000. Yes. Um, and, uh, and this is still in place at the moment. This is the current This is policy. the current policy, yes. Uh, and the term available is 12 months um, 
to um, 84 months, which I think, if my maths is correct, is seven years. That's correct. Um, and there's various requirements. One is that um, there's a maximum age of the vehicle um, of 15 years. I can put that to one side. What is meant by maximum LVR? Um, so maximum LVR is, oh sorry, so LVR um, is the value of the loan um, divided by um, the assessed value of the vehicle. Um, the, the loan valuation ratio. Yes. That, um, and the maximum that's offered is 180%. Um, is that still the position at Westpac, that that's the maximum? This is, this is the current policy, so Thank yes. you. Uh, and can, can you explain how that operates in the context of someone walking into a car dealer and buying, uh, buying a $10,000 car? Uh, so the only way um, that it could operate in the context of somebody walking in and buying a $10,000 car is if they came in um, uh, with a trade-in um, uh, which was encumbered by finance so that there was some significant negative equity I see. Um, in the trade-in so that the, the loan that we were financing was for the purchase um, of the vehicle. Um, and then to get that vehicle um, you know, out of the showroom will quite often take it above 100% anyway if we're funding more. Um, but then um, you know, with the addition of um, the negative equity that was attributed to the so does, am I right to say that you that Westpac will loan more than the value of the car, though? Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Um, and when Westpac would um, lend more than the value of the car, one of the things that might be above and beyond the value of the car would be um, the payment of add-on insurance or an origination fee or any of the other fees that are impl imposed at the time of purchase. Quite Is that right. right? Quite right. Um, in fact, it's your policy is it not that the LVR may include insurances with the exception of CCI insurance, mm -hmm. um, brokerage and origination fees. Um, all of those can come within the loan valuation ratio, is that correct? Um, that's, that's correct. If that's a convenient yes, time. Yes, of course. Sure. Mr Godkin, we'll have to ask you to return in time to begin at 2 p.m. Yes, Mr. Denali. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner. And Mr. Godkin, before lunch, we were dealing with an overview of the product features of the car loan agreements. Yes. Uh, and I was asking some questions about uh, LVR. You mm -hmm. recall? Is it right that the higher an LVR? Um, the higher the risk from a responsible lending perspective? Um, no, I don't believe so. Um, if, if the LVR is uh, higher, is it, not the, um, is it not the case that uh, the amount borrowed far exceeds um, or at least if it's 180%, it far exceeds the asset, um, which is the subject of the borrowing? That's correct. Uh, and is that a relevant factor for the purposes of um, responsible lending? It it might be in some circumstances, but not generally, I would have said. Okay. If I can take you away from that document to um, um, I think it's 
PG1 <coughs> C22 in your materials, WBC.100.009.4848. Yes. Um, what's this? I'm sorry, it hasn't come up yet. <coughs> um, what's this document, Mr. Godkin? Uh, this document is the are the uh, guidelines um, for. Uh, uh, the team that does quality assurance I see. Um, in our business. So these are the, the notes that they would use um, specifically for the purpose of reviewing originated loans um, for quality assurance. I see. And on the first page, um, in fact, the, the background says that responsible lending obligations set out in the National Credit Act require licensees to conduct unsuitability assessments prior in entering into suggesting or assisting a customer to apply for a credit contract. You see that? Yes, I do. And it sets out then a summary of the some of the requirements under the um, National Credit Act. Yes. Now, is it the case that if one goes down under the heading of methodology, uh, there is a um, an indication that the following classes um, are considered higher risk from responsible lending perspective. Can you see that? High value, high loan value ratios? Yes. And, and likewise in terms of the sample selection methodology that's to be used, immediately below that, there's actually a focus on borrowers with an LVR of over 150%. Do you see that? That's correct. So is it the case that uh, uh, an LVR is a relevant consideration in the course of considering responsible lending obligations? <coughs> so. And, and, and forgive me, but, but I may be misunderstanding the question. But um, but these um, these factors that you pointed to on this uh, on this document, this is what we use to identify cohorts of customers uh, for whom there might be a higher risk of um, responsible lending. Um, uh, issue. So, so typically, um, a customer who's borrowed a higher LVR um, uh, might be a little more stressed in their financial circumstances more generally. So, that would be a good place to go and have a look to explore um, whether we've done everything that we need to do. So, so it's about it, 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 it actually describes a cohort of customers rather than saying the LVR itself creates the responsible lending issue, if that makes sense. I see. Um, but as I, understand, as I understand Westpac's policy, it's willing to offer a customer loan for 80% mm. more than the market value of the product that's being sold? In some circumstances, that's correct. Um, and, and just to be clear, I dealt with some of this before lunch, but one reason why it might be, you use the example of a a trading that Correct, might and, and negative equity yeah. and negative equity mm -hmm. uh, and that might be one reason mm -hmm. another reason might be that uh, it enables the payment of fees above and beyond the value of the car at the time of the purchase of the car uh, in combination it was it's with uh, the car yes always with the car so certain fees are always payable as i understand it when you enter into a loan with westpac an establishment fee yes monthly administration fee, there might be some mm. fees charges on, on early termination. Um, there's an origination fee. Correct. So people can go over the, the LVR and in fact, in your experience, is it not uncommon for a customer to receive a loan for an amount which is greater than the market value of the car? Um, it's, that's, that's correct, it's not uncommon. I see. 
Now, the next, returning to where we were previously in terms of the um, uh, PG116, so this is back in the St George Automotive Finance Lending Credit Policy, yes. WBC.104.001.7836. At seven eight five zero. Another issue that's, or another feature that's raised, is what's described as a residual balloon limit. What's that mean? Uh, so a residual balloon, um, uh, or what we refer to as balloon payments, uh, uh, would indicate that the borrower. Um, has chosen not to pay off 100% of the loan um, over the initial term. So, so for example, um, a borrower might decide to take out a four-year loan um, with a 20% residual, uh, which means that there is a 20% balloon payment um, left over at the end of the four-year term. I see. And is that a relevant factor in considering one's responsible lending obligations? Uh, that is, yes. And if you just go over to the next page. <coughs> Am I, um, is, are these various fees, some of which I've already referred to, an accurate description of the various fees that are imposed um, by Westpac um, at the time of the purchase of a car? So specifically the establishment fee, yes. Um, the other two are not, no. The other, and when you say the other two, um, the monthly administration fee and the fees on early termination, they're things that arise then during the course of the loan or may arise during the course of the loan. That's correct. Thank you. Now in your statement you set out, thank you, I'm done with that document. In your statement you um, you set out in, in quite some detail what you describe as the five stages of the approval and monitoring of car loans. Yes. Now, I'm going to come to those um, in, um, in due course, but I'd like to deal with um, an issue first, um, or at least introduce it by in introducing another provision of the the National Credit Act, again, one with which you're familiar, and then to deal with some issues as to the remuneration of car dealers, if I may. Okay. So the first document I'll take you to is RCD.0022.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.
And can I ask you, without going to um, an extra E um, yet, can I ask you just in broad terms to explain how car dealers uh, come to be remunerated by Westpac? Sure. Um, so there's um, uh, three key types of um, remuneration for car dealers um, and in order of significance. Um, the first of those is um, uh, what we in the industry refers to as um, flex commissions. Yes. Um, so they are commissions which are paid um, as a percentage of the margin that is achieved over a base rate that we set. See? Um, the second of the three uh, um, uh, incentives which are typically by, um, tied to aggregate volumes over the course of a month. So at the end of the month we would pay a dealer um, some amount um, which was based on um, uh, the amount of business that they wrote over the course of that month. I see. Um, uh, and then the, uh, the third category are fees which are, uh, I, I'm going to describe as generally flat in nature, i.e. they don't go up or down based on any variable, it's just an amount that we pay them, we might call it a marketing contribution or some other fee, but it's basically flat. I see. And part of your evidence you deal with um, a dealer agreement, the remuneration, does that form part of the dealer agreement or is that separate? To uh, it's typically separate to the agreement, yes. And the first, perhaps I can take you in a little bit more detail to the first of um, those uh, forms of remuneration you described as flex commission. Yes. Um, now, as I understand that Westpac sets a base rate for the specific dealer. So if I'm a, a dealer, mm -hmm. you would set a base rate and then the dealer um, has a discretion to determine the interest rate that is charged by the customer. Is that right? Uh, that is, uh, that, that is correct. Yes. And the difference between what's the base rate and what's the customer rate is, uh, is, is the margin. That's correct. And am I right then to understand that the dealer gets a percentage of that margin and in fact I won't disclose what the margin is uh, because of its um, sensitivity, but am I right to say that the Westpac gets a percentage of that margin and the dealer also gets a percentage of that margin. That's correct, yep. Do customers ever know that there is, that that's something that, uh, that is a, the way that commission structure works? Uh, no. Certainly Ms. Thera Vangadam would never have known about it, would she? No, no customer. Um, knows about that structure, I don't think. Um, and am I right? Do I understand how flex commissions work? That the dealer has a an interest in the margin being higher so that he, she or it then gets a higher commission. Is that right? That's correct. Now, up until August... 2016, there was actually no maximum um, rate at all, was there, that was imposed by Westpac? Um, sorry, I'm just checking the date, but, um, but yes, that's correct. And And now there is a maximum rate, or at least since that date there's been a maximum. That's correct. So when one walks in, when Ms. Theravangadam um, Thera walks into the dealership or any other person who ultimately becomes a Westpac customer, the dealer earns more money the higher the interest rate is by virtue of the flex commission, is that right? That's correct. 
Now, in your statement, you say that in September of last year, ASIC announced that a new legislative instrument had been registered on the Federal <coughs> Register of Legislative Instruments, such that flex commissions would be prohibited from November 2018. You're obviously aware of that. Uh, yes, I am. And I'm not trying to trick you, but you deal with this in an e at paragraph six. Yes. Now, sitting here now, Westpac still allows flex commissions. That's correct. And are you aware of what ASIC said about the imposition of flex commissions at the time of announcing um, that it would be prohibiting them from November of this year? Uh, yes, I mean, there have been various consultation papers from ASIC and I'm generally aware of their views on yeah. Flex and, Commission, yes. And you referred to, well, you referred to the ASIC announcement, maybe I'll call that up, it's um, rcd.0021.0001.033 Uh, and you'll see that this is an announcement on the 7th of September, as you said in your statement. Yep. Yes. Um, that ASIC's formally banned flex commissions in the car finance market. Um, and then an explanation of, um, uh, an explanation of the background. If one goes over to the next page, There's um, a reference to the lender and dealer share the flex amount. The percentage of flex amount kept by the dealer varies significantly and can be up to 80% of the interest charges. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And when you indicated that you were familiar with the fact that there had been some reviews of flex commission for some time. Yes. Um, and one of the reasons why, or a number of reasons were given uh, by um, ASIC in its various, um, uh, in, its very, in the course of these consultations, um, is it right to say that one of the concerns about flex commissions is that the interest rate charged to the consumer is not related to their credit rating or risk of default, but to um, but to what they can negotiate with the, the dealer. Is that right? That's fair. Um, does it, is it right to say that it provides an incentive for sales intermediaries to inter increase the price of the credit contract? Um, it can, yes. And, and I think you've, you've already said that um, customers don't know about it. It's not something that's disclosed to them. That's correct. Now, if I can move to the next part of... But, uh, why Sorry. continue? Um, so, sorry, why continue? Why continue it? Um, uh, <coughs> some, something that, the, that we've all, um, certainly considered. Um, the, um, uh, the, the issue in this market is, um, in terms of the way that we compete, um, is that it would be in our view, impossible to stop it unilaterally without stepping away from the market altogether. Do you predict then that uh, the situation will remain unchanged until uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, date fixed by ASIC as the date by which the practice must cease? Um, yes. Yes, I do. And no information of any sort about this is given to a consumer. Is that right? That's correct. That the party negotiating the loan, commonly the business manager at the car yard. Yes. Um, can act in a way dictated by the interests of that business? They, they can, yes. Regardless of the interests of the consumer? It's possible, yes. May that present uh, an issue under the Credit Act about a credit representative uh, having a conflict of that kind and neither revealing it nor uh, preferring uh, the client's interest to the personal interest of the intermediary? Um, again, I feel unqualified to give you a legal view um, Unfair question. Thank You're you. right to call me out on yeah. it, Mr. Godkin. Um, yes. There's a further. Uh, uh, further amount which I think fits under that. Um, heading which you describe in your um, your uh, statement as a percentage amount financed or a PAF um, or PAF. Instead of a flex commission, a small number of dealers are paid a percentage of the amount financed. That's correct. Um, is that as common as flex commissions? No, it's a it's a it's actually limited to a single mark or brand um, um, of dealers, which is. Um, tiny in our book. I see. Um, and if I can just explore this with you, mm. does that raise the same issues? Ex exactly the same. And what about if um, the third that you have in this um, is a minimum commission whereby there's just a minimum amount instead of a flex commission, um, which is paid when the flex commission is calculated less than the minimum commission? It's not, it's not instead of. I'm sorry? Sorry, it's not instead of. So a minimum commission will be a minimum commission and then there would be flex on top of oh, that. Oh, yes, I, I see. see. I, I guess your statement says instead of, but, sorry, I, yeah. but I understand the way you, yeah. um, you explain it. Then there's also incentives based on volume of loans originated. Now, this is, a, as I understand it, different. This is the second category of, of remuneration. And a dealer might be paid a VBI, or volume-based incentive, on the total volume of car loans originated by that dealer. Is that right? That's correct. And the dealer receives a higher commission for higher volume of car loans? That's Is that correct. right? And does it matter in relation to that incentive how much the, uh, how much the interest rate is? No, it does not. Am I right to say that where you have a flex commission, mm -hmm. it raises an issue of the type that we referred to before, which is a, there is a conflict between the position of the dealer in getting as much commission as he can or she can, and the customer, <laughs> who unaware of this, ends up paying more than the base rate for their car loan. Uh, so there's potentially a conflict, as, as I've said before, yes. 
Is that, if I can take you to um, just a private screen, um, WBC.300.021.7233. Um, this uh, <clears throat> um, I am familiar with the document. If it helps, you know the document that I'm referring to. This is a um, a group assurance report. What's a group assurance report, Mr. Godkin? Um, it's a. Um, uh, a third line of defence. Um, uh, think of it as an audit report, um, um, but internally, and it might cover um, um, operational risk. It might cover credit risk. Um, uh, it's a it's a team within the the bank that has a look at our processes and practices with a view to reporting on uh, performance against controls. Correct and risks for the Correct. the company. If you can go to um, underscore zero 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 three, please. Um, I don't think you've got the, um, the document in front of you, but I'll go to the relevant um, part. And you said you were familiar with this document. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of the issues... I'll just hand a copy to you. Thank you to my learned friend. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> And I'm um, at page underscore zero 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 three or page four of twenty three. Yes. And one of the issues identified there um, as issue one with a high rating is this. There are weaknesses in the design of remuneration structures and monitoring of sales practices for dealerships who are originating retail auto finance loans, while prevalent across the auto industry and not unique to the St George auto finance business, current practices significantly increase the risk of unfair consumer outcomes, whereby dealer behaviour may be influenced by commission plan design and the ability of a customer to negotiate. Do you see that? Yes, I do. That's the very concern, isn't it, that <coughs> we were discussing beforehand? Um, that is the concern. That is. And that's why we would advocate change. Yep. And well, when you say you advocate change, your answer before is that it's still, uh, it's still a charge that's imposed by Westpac, isn't it? Um, it's still a pricing structure in the market that Westpac participates in, yes. And here, um, there is a... Um, there is a reference to presumably one of your colleagues and a date, an interim date for scoping of proposed working group plans, further dates and action plans will then be agreed. Uh, none of that work has led to the removal of the weaknesses in the design of the remuneration structures yet, has it? Um, no, that work specifically has led to um, the various consultations um, with ASIC and the work that is now underway um, to meet the um, deadline of 1st of November this year. By which point, by which time Westpac will no longer charge flex commissions, obviously? Um, again, so Westpac doesn't charge flex commissions, but it's part of the pricing structure. But yes, part of the, yes. your, your point is right. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, No, it's the customer that pays, not Westpac, isn't it? <clears throat> it's an uncharitable point of view. Um, God can... The, um, well, so, sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting we pay, I was just saying we, we weren't charging it. The customer, so the commission is built into the price, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, you recognise there's a problem about this? Absolutely recognise it. You recognise there's a problem about poor customer outcomes? Uh, yes, absolutely. And recognised a significant increase in risk of poor out customer outcomes? That's correct. Yes. 
what have you done in response to the observation that there is a significant increase in the risk of unfair customer outcomes? Um, so, so one of those things was to introduce the um, cap on pricing, which we did. Um, That's uh, the August 16 yes, cap, correct. was it? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, the second um, was to um, roll out um, uh, code of conduct and um, customer fairness trading um, across our business manager network and made that compulsory and that was in late 2015 and is now part of our accreditation process and our annual training regime which I refer to in the uh, in the general statement. Um, uh, but more significantly and because we believe that the solution to this needs to be an industry solution. Um, we have participated in the work which is being led by ASIC. But you've referred to th three things there. If I take the first two. Yeah. Um, one of the requirements on Westpac under the National Credit Act is to have in place adequate arrangements to ensure that there's no comp that customers aren't disadvantaged uh, by conflicts of interest. Now, in relation to both the things that you've put forward, the cap still leaves the scope for disadvantage, does it not? Um, it still leaves the, the risk correct. there, yes, correct. I and, and if I may say, mm -hmm. you do it in con considerable detail. You go through the various changes, and we'll come to some of the changes yeah. that have been made, and the training that's given to dealers. But let's be frank here, the dealers make more money the higher the interest rate is, don't they? Acknowledged, yes. So it's not an adequate uh, arrangement to stop this issue by saying to the dealers, uh, act, act fairly, act in accordance with good practice, because the higher they charge, the more flex commission they get, don't they? Yeah, th that's absolutely right. And we haven't suggested that that is the solution. It can't be. There needs to be an industry solution. I understand. Um, and I understand are, that's your evidence. But in the meantime, has there been any step taken recognising there's a significant increase in risk of unfair customer outcomes? Has there been any step taken to catch or prevent or avoid that risk coming home and there being unfair customer outcomes? So, uh, other than the, the, the two steps that I've mentioned, no. Thank you. So. <coughs> Are you aware of other players that have no longer charged flex commissions? Uh, no, I'm not. Have you given, um, has Westpac given consideration to, to having in place some adequate arrangements to deal with this conflict by removing flex commissions? Um, considerable consideration, yes. Can I move to another issue, please, Mr Godkin? You take this document down now, Mr Denali. Ah, yes. Are we done Thank with you. that? Could... Thank you. Um, if that could be tendered subject to a an application will be made by my learned friend in relation to confidentiality, Commissioner. Would that be Exhibit uh, 1.144, I think, uh, Group Assurance Report uh, <coughs> WBC 300-02172-33, Mr Sheehan, do you say that there should be some non-publication uh, direction made about it? So uh, the, the particular page that the witness was asked about, no. Right. Uh, as, as to the balance, um, just pro tem, we only found out about these documents last night, so the process of th this and a number of others, the process, process of examining them and getting instructions for confidentiality is continuing as we speak. Uh, and I understand our learned friends are content to have us put on those applications and deal with them in due course. Then if the, the, the particular page that we've got is uh, released 
No difficulty, am I right? No difficulty. And uh, then we can face the other difficulties as and when they're perhaps a little more refined. Is that convenient yep. course? It is. Yes, thank you. Yes. In your evidence, you've of course accepted that Westpac itself has significant responsible lending obligations, that's <coughs> right? Yes, I have. Yep. Um, and one for which you, as the lender, and no one else is liable for your conduct? Uh, yes. And if I can put it this way, there's a somewhat of a Tension might be the um, might not be the right word, but the face of the sale of the Westpac loan, the face is actually the manager or the business manager at the dealer. Isn't that right? That, that's correct. And in fact, for um, Ms. <coughs> Thuravangadam, it was the, the person described as the manager who was the face, effectively, of, of Westpac. Now, to, sorry, I, I don't wish to. I know it wasn't Westpac, but it was the face, the person with whom she dealt. That's, that's correct. Now, the fact that that is the position heightens rather than lowers the requirements on Westpac to exercise care to ensure that it satisfies its obligations under the National Credit Act, doesn't it? Um, yes, I think that's fair. And the dealer, if I can take you to the dealer agreement at PJ, sorry, PG1-1, um, WBC.300.055.596, Um, this is the first step, I think, that you describe in your process, in your statement. This is the entry into a dealer agreement mm -hmm. between a dealer and Westpac. That's correct. And it sets out various of the obligations, uh, rights and obligations of the parties, doesn't it, in relation to that yes, it does. relationship? Yep. Not, however, the remuneration. We've dealt with that. Yes. Now, under this agreement, if one goes to 0.5966, yes. um, and where there's a reference to us, that means Westpac, mm -hmm. um, 3.1 says a credit offer must be submitted to us, that is to Westpac, in the form and manner we reasonably require. Do you see that? Yes, I do. So, Westpac can reasonably require its dealers to provide credit offers or submit them in a particular form or manner? Yes. And they do that yes. by use of the system. What's that system called again? Uh, Sovereign. Sovereign, that's right. Sovereign would have been the system that in 2012 too, that, that the manager sitting in the office, you heard Ms. Mm -hmm. Thera uh, van der Gerdam's evidence, that would have been the system that he was typing into, one assumes, at that. That's at correct. That time. Yes. Now, this agreement specifies some limited circumstances in which, and I say limited because they're prescribed in clause 11F on page 56, sorry, 5969, where you must provides that you, being the dealer, must, as our agent, carry out the identification verification procedures required by law and our AML requirements. Now, AML we can put to one side. That's anti-money laundering. Mm -hmm. It's not relevant. Uh, and the I identification verification proce procedures um, uh, is the other aspect. And it's those two things that are done 
by the dealer as an agent and only those two things. Is that right? Sorry. It's I, those two things and only those two things that are done by the dealer. I'm sorry, I apologise. Would you mind repeating the two no, things? Not at all. Sorry. It's those two things that are, and, and only those two things, which are done by the dealer as an agent for Westpac. Yeah, no, sorry. I'm, He's lost on what the two things okay. are. Oh. Thank you. Okay. The, no, sorry. Back, back a square. What are the two things? <laughs> what are the two things? Thank you. As our agent carry out, one, the identification verification procedures required by law. Yep. Do you see that? It might be yes. easy on the screen, Mr. Cochran. Yep. Yep. And our AML requirements. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Yes. Yep. It wasn't a trick question. <laughs> no. uh, then on two pages further along, clause 13.1, no agency, except for any purposes specifically set out in this agreement, you are not our agent for any purpose. You do not have any authority to do anything on our behalf. Yes. 13.2 um, says you are not you are under no obligation to obtain or procure credit offers or to do business with us. You acknowledge that if you do obtain any credit offer, then you do so for the convenience of your customers and the expectation that it will assist your business. Yes. So this dealer agreement itself makes very clear where a distinction between Westpac mm -hmm. and the dealer on the other hand. Yes. But I think I'm right to say that Westpac nevertheless requires dealers to do a number of things and undertake a number of functions that it, that is Westpac, would have to do if it didn't have dealers. Uh, yes. Captures information Correct. from the customer, mm -hmm. puts that information into Sovereign, We'll come to what happens with yeah. it, but puts that information. But for the dealer, mm -hmm. Westpac would have to do that themselves. Correct, and, and importantly has a conversation with the customer. Correct. And this document then, when one goes to the schedule at 0.5978, you'll see that you also require, so leaving aside the legal matters that we've mm -hmm. just gone to in the dealer agreement, you require, you Westpac require dealers to do a number of things in relation to credit offers. Yes. One, in fact, 1.1, before submitting a credit offer to us, you must make any inquiries we require you to make to assist us in satisfying our responsible lending obligations. You see that? Yes. One point three, each time you submit a credit offer to us, you declare that. Amongst other things, you get to D, all information given by you or on your behalf is correct, not misleading, to the best of our knowledge. Yes. See that? Clause two, or this <coughs> point two, is headed information and documentation, and it requires you, being the, or, sorry, the dealer, to submit to Westpac various documents. Yes. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Now these things, you agree with me that these things are, um, are things that are required to be done for responsible lending? Uh, yes. And you capture that information I can use that language, I think mm -hmm. that's your language in your statement. You capture that information by getting the dealers to obtain that information for you. Uh, yes. Still in the same document, and you referred to this beforehand at 0 0.5989, This is what's described as the code of conduct and customer fairness outcome principles. Is this what you were referring to before? Uh, not specifically. I mean, it is now codified in our um, dealer agreements, but we um, 
uh, we, we put dealer managers or business managers through specific um, code of conduct and customer fairness training, which is what I was referring to, um, which is included in the general statement as one of the attachments, one of the yes, training that, storyboards. Uh, uh, yeah, one of those storyboards yeah, that deals so with that aspect of the process. Yes, cool. So, so it's, it's in addition to this, that's the way I describe it. Um, and that it provides that the principles below are to be applied to encourage best practice and ensure that customers who are marketed and sold products and services by you that are financed by us receive honest, efficient and measured treatment throughout the sale process. You yes. see that? Yes. And then down the bottom, it says, you must comply with responsible lending practices which include, and then three things are set out. Yes. And broadly, that reflects what's in the National Credit Act. Indeed. But it's not actually a requirement generally that dealers comply with the National Credit Act because generally they're outside it by way of the exemption, the point of sale exemption. So, so, so not by virtue of the Act itself, no? No. Um, so when it says you must comply with responsible lending practices, you, you are saying that that's not a legal obligation on them. You are saying by this document, we want you to comply with responsible lending obligations. Well, I'll probably put it slightly stronger. We, we are saying we require you um, to comply as part of this agreement. Under the law, though, the requirement for compliance is on you. Yes, and, and, and this is not a substitute for our obligations at all. Thank you. But you rely, I think it's fair to say, rely heavily on, on the dealers. Yes, we do. They perform a number of functions. And in fact, the loan application form used by third party dealers, that in itself is the primary source for Westpac evidencing whether or not reasonable inquiries have been made, isn't it? Um, uh, when you say the form, it's the, it's the system capture. The system capture in uh, Sovereign. Uh, but with that, with that amendment, yes, absolutely. So that suite of documents that we've gone through, there's the legal provisions in the dealer agreement, but mm -hmm. then those which we have gone to, Schedule 1 and Schedule 6, require declarations and or under the Code of Conduct, a statement, declaration mm -hmm. that dealers will do all of these things in the interests of responsible lending, in the interest of Westpac satisfying its res responsible lending obligations. Uh, yeah, yeah, and its customer fairness obligations, yeah. Now, can I take you to, is this, to a private screen document, WBC.300.060.2667, Might be a moment, Mr. Cogkin. Um, now, this is up on my screen, but it's not. Um, but mm -hmm. my learned friend is offering me lots of assistance. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sheehan, does this document differ from the last one in some respect about whether to keep it? The same category, Commissioner. The, uh, our learner friends have been good enough to indicate to us the pages to which they uh, intend to take the witness. There's no problem with those pages. Being so we can put this page up publicly? The page can go up. I mean, it, so assuming that it's the one to the extent told to we To the extent to which we can, I want to do that. Of course. So, uh, yes, so it can it's go up publicly. Point 0668 can go up.
Okay, thank you. Sorry, if you just go to the, you've got the hard copy of the front okay. page. What, just for the, is, all of our assistance, what is this document? Yeah. Sorry, this is a, sorry, now I've got to find the front page. Uh, so this is a uh, second line controls uh, assurance uh, memo. Um, in, in, in broad terms, it falls into the same category uh, as the previous document that we referred to in, in that it's a type of audit um, of risk controls and functions. I see. Have we got a date on it, Mr Godkin, or a, uh, at least a year? A 24th of February uh, 2017. Thank you. So. I think this is later, a more recent document. Yes. It's a document about a year ago. Yes. <clears throat> and there under the heading St George Auto Finance, it says, I understand this to be consistent with what you said before, mm -hmm. the loan application form used by third party dealers is the primary source for evidencing whether reasonable inquiries have been made by a dealer about a customer's financial situation and their requirements and objectives. Do you see that? Uh, yes, I do. Now, this is at February 2017, mm -hmm. so some four and a half years after uh, the case study that we've been talking about. And there was some testing done, and it indicates that at the time of our testing, being Westpac's testing, for the 10 files reviewed, the loan application forms did not articulate that the loan repayment terms aligned with the customer's requirements and objectives, or whether the dealer obtained details regarding customer monthly living expenses when completing the application. Do you see that? Yes, I do. That's a matter of grave concern to you, isn't it? Um. <coughs> Uh, so it's for exactly that reason that um, we have built some uh, additional requirements into the application capture process um, uh, that um, allow us to verify um, more readily um, the conversation that's taken place in relationship to the requirements and objectives um, for a customer. I, see. Um, I mean, historically, in the main, if I may, um, historically in the main for this business, there was um, an acceptance that the requirements and objectives for this purpose were quite simple in that people walked into a dealer to buy a car, so we understood what they were doing. Um, um, our capability has been extended so that we can have quite specific conversations about um, how they would deal with issues like um, balloon payments, for example, which we touched on earlier. So, am I right to say, on the basis of your answer, that at around this time, so this yes. is February 2017, yes. you feared that the processes weren't working? Um, uh, in, in, in fact, that... Um, the changes that I've just talked about, um, which we released in August um, of last year, so August um, 2017, um, were already in, um, call it manufacturer, um, at the time that this um, document was um, produced. So, so I can't say specifically when, um, uh, you know, the business was having the discussions which, hey, these areas are um, uh, weak and need tightening up. Um, but by the time this document was written, um, you at least part of the solution was already um, underway. And then, and is that a reference to the fact that there was a responsible lending project in place that's commenced in November 2016? Is that what you're getting at? Uh, that, that's correct. That's, that was part of it, yes. Um, can I then, ta and I think I did take you to the wrong time then for the purposes mm -hmm. of answering the question. The question that I want to put to you is October 2016, if I can put you back there, yep. if I may. Mm -hmm. At that time, you feared that the processes weren't working, didn't you? Um, uh, so, of course, I wasn't actually in the business, just to be... Yeah, sorry, I'm, but, I know you're the representative of Westpac. Uh, yes, in, indeed. So, um, uh, but um, can I put the question based on... The evidence that you've given, your knowledge of 
so, uh, so th of so, the business. So, so th through the process of the work that was being done at a group level um, uh, in relation to building out a group-wide um, responsible lending um, framework, um, the business became um, more aware of some of the issues that needed addressing in this business, I think is fair. Well, you recognise, Westpac recognised in October 2016 <coughs> that its responsible lending obligations were lacking, didn't it? Westpac recognised that it could do more, yes. When you say that it could do more, mm -hmm. as at the time of this testing, it indicates that, and I accept it's a small s mm. sample, but of the 10 yeah. files that had been reviewed, well, Westpac had been doing nowhere near enough, had it? Well, he certainly recognised that we were not evidencing what we were doing well enough. Yeah. So. So it's always been a requirement for the business manager to have a comprehensive conversation um, with the customer. And we had relied on the application process um, as verification um, of that conversation. What, what this report clearly demonstrated and, and, and previous pieces of work was that actually that the, the current capture of the application process wasn't sufficient to evidence that the requirements and objectives conversation had happened. It, it, it wasn't reasonable verification because of the issues that you've identified, Correct. was it? Correct. Is it... Is it right to say then that Westpac considered, in light of what I've taken you to, uh, that the dealers, it was the dealers upon whom the obligations to do the respons responsible lending checks, it was on them to do those responsible lending checks. Um, so, so uh, not in total, um, but it was certainly, um, uh, the business certainly relied on the business managers um, to have critical parts of the conversations and particularly around um, requirements um, and objectives. So yes, it was on them. And the, and the proof that we had relied on in that that conversation um, had taken place, which was in the application form, um, it, you know, we grew to believe was probably not sufficient. With the benefit of, with the benefit of the work that's been done, it was the position that at some point, but certainly in October 2013, it wasn't possible for Westpac to uh, rely on that, uh, on the dealers uh, to sufficiently verify that information, could they? Well, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, and I think you meant 16, sorry, but, but, uh, but uh, 2016, but um, it wasn't sufficient for us to rely on the evidence that we'd been relying on, I think is. The system wasn't showing that it, it was happening. Correct. That's exactly right. You so made it, an agreement with the dealer that certain things would happen. Yes. But what you were seeing in the system didn't show that those things were happening. Correct. Yeah. One of the ways this Royal Commission is working is to ident identify particular case studies. Mm -hmm. But that's shown, isn't it, very obviously in Miss uh, Thea of Angradam's position, isn't it? Because it simply didn't work in that case because the application form bore no resemblance to the material that was actually required. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating because there's, there's a couple of different issues here because there's a requirements and objectives conversation and, um, and I think in that case study, arguably that was kind of reasonably clear, um, but what we certainly missed in that case study, which we've discussed previously, was some of the verification around uh, some of the financial circumstances. Yes. Yep. Now, is this page going into evidence, is it, Mr. Dinelli? It is. Exhibit 1.145 will Thank be you. a page from the second line controls assurance memo of 24 February 
17 at WBC 300-060-2668. The risk of um, upsetting the flow, might I request a short comfort stop? I'm sorry? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, better you pipe up than you don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Conkin. Thank you. Uh, if I come back at, what, 10 past 3? Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Nelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, you've given some evidence about the accreditation process, which involves a number of steps, including submitting um, an accreditation application form. Yes. Um, and you exhibit that as PG12 WBC.100.009.8344. Yes. Uh, and I could take you to point eight three four five. Yes. There just seems to be a, the words have disappeared on the screen. Um, won't be a moment, Mr. It's okay. Perhaps I can, you've got this document in front of you. Yes, I do. Um, perhaps I can ask you when it was last updated by Westpac. Is it the bottom right hand corner? The Would that be? Uh, it was, no, I'm not, I don't know. So. Um, the, I, I'm not that, sure if that refers to when we printed out no, no, a copy or it was the update. Don't, if you don't know, that's fine. Um, was this one of the documents that you say has been um, updated over the course of, or recently, since you've started doing um, further work in this area? Uh, um, well, I know that we introduced the um, requirement for a uh, police clearance check last year, so... Um, so that suggests that this is at least a r relatively recent version, because this re refers to... To that. The, the National Police Clearance Certificate, Correct. doesn't it? So. Um, on the second page of that document, um, you refer to an accredited person and you say, you are acting as the bank's agent when you arrange finance for a customer. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, is that what... Um, it, is that what Westpac understands that dealers are doing, acting as their agent for the arranging of the finance? Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to, to, to that. So, so I'm very clear about um, what their role is, um, and I'm very clear about the processes and controls that we put in place or need to put in place um, to manage that role, whether they're acting as agent or not in certain aspects of that, I, I just don't know, I'm afraid. This, this document and, some, and the previous documents, including the declarations that I've taken you mm -hmm. to, would it be a fair reading to, would it be a fair reading to say that Westpac is effectively saying you are, we're subcontracting to you the need to do these things, do them on our behalf. Um, I, I think that's, I, I think that's reasonable if I can, the, the, the way that I think about this is that we have got some documents um, that basically say to the dealer, um, uh, you're going to need to do what we need you to do so that we can fulfil our obligations in the way that we need you to do it, and we're going to provide you with training and accreditation processes to get you there. I see. Um, so Sorry. if they um, <clears throat> if they do their job, Westpac does its job. Is that what you mean? 
Um, if we boast to our job, then Westpac does its job. Um, this document also indicates that the person, the accredited person, when they come to sign this, will act as an agent of the bank and not as an agent of the customer. Do you see that? It's a, the second dot point, third dot point, I'm sorry. Yes, I do. Do you see? that there's a requirement that or the accredited person needs to be able to attest to, I will obtain a good understanding of the customer's needs, objective and financial position sufficient to be comfortable the product being financed is suitable for them. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Take all reasonable steps to ensure that all applications for finance are true and accurate, completed in full, read and understood by the customer before submission. Yes. That it might be read as essentially an outsourcing of the obligations of the dealers to do all of those things, isn't it? Uh, uh, it, it, it might be read to um, suggest that, but it's absolutely not the case. Does it come to this, Mr. God? Can mm -hmm. you make an agreement which, if it is performed uh, according to its terms, yes. uh, would lead to there being uh, a loan that is made responsibly? Uh, yes, yes. The question then behind that mm -hmm. is. Yes, you make the contract with the dealer saying mm. you are bound by contract to us to do all these things. Mm. Then what is it that Westpac does beyond make the, making the contract that says go and do these right. things? Um, so, thank you. The, uh, and, and, and a really important part of making this business work well. So, um, so, so the framework that we have, and parts of it are still maturing, um, but the framework that we have, um, which, which starts with those agreements, um, but then goes to um, accreditation and training so that we make sure that the business managers understand what they are supposed to be doing. Um, uh, we then have what I would describe as guided processes um, through the system um, so that in some elements um, they are directed very specifically to um, enter fields or answer questions or ask questions um, so that um, at least in some elements of the application process we know that they're stepping through those steps because they can't move forward if they don't um, step through those steps and that will include in some cases that I mentioned before um, undisclosed minimums in some expense fields so that if they put in zero actually it's going to get referred and somebody's going to ask. Um, some questions. So that, that's a really important second part of the process. Um, the third part of the process is the monitoring um, that we do across a range of um, aspects and, and it's, it, you know, I do talk about it in, in, in my general witness statement but it includes, um, you know, calling customers as mystery shoppers post the event. It includes the quality assurance program that we talked to um, earlier in relation to that um, document. It, it includes the hindsighting that we do on um, credit reviews, it includes some insurance that we do, um, specifically around some CCI insurance and, and, uh, and, and others. So that's a really important part of the framework. But then finally, none of that works um, if that doesn't tie into a cost consequence management framework um, that takes the feedback from all of that monitoring activity and then feeds it back into the right part of our business so that we're getting corrective behaviours where that's, that's necessary. And that's, that's part of a framework or program that's been building out um, over the last two years. There are parts of it which are kind of mature and there are parts of it which are less mature. But that is the that it, that is the the kind of the four pillars of making sure that um, everybody in the business lives up to those agreements. But you're not there yet no, because parts of it are immature? That's that is correct. 
what's the comparative importance of the parts that are immature compared with those that are now mature? Well, so the parts that are immature are some of the... Um, uh, uh, so there's a couple of elements of the monitoring, so not all elements, but there are a couple of elements of the monitoring that um, um, that need rolling out more broadly. Um, and then um, uh, more recently we have added an escalation process to the consequence management framework so that, you know, it's really clear that the deal of the business managers are are getting the right feedback at the right time, or alternatively, you know, in in you know really bad situations, finding something else to do. Um, so, I'm not sure that I've answered your question, but I don't. It, it's hard. But to what I'm trying to get is some sense of whether there are critical elements of the framework which are still immature or not rolled out. No, I don't think so. Um, might have to expand on the answer a bit yep. uh, beyond that, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, so we have, um, for example, a, um, a the, the, the QA um, or the quality assurance process that, um, uh, that we run through, um, which is already feeding back to um, the business managers, we are still maturing the consequence management um, framework. So instead of it being a um, conversation um, that is recorded in the call report, there's a bit more teeth to it. So like, you have the conversation, but understand that the next conversation will be with the dealer principal rather than the business manager. Or, you know, and if we get to three conversations, you're probably going to be showing cause about why you should still be a business manager. Um, so and, uh, it, 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 it's difficult because this thing, like the framework, it, it is powerful as a as a whole thing. Um, yes. Um, Can I take you to paragraph thirty-seven of your statement? So. And you say there that the dealer business managers are specifically required to not merely accept what the cost customer tells them, but to ask specific questions to ensure that all the necessary detail is captured. You recall I referred to captured before. That's where you use mm -hmm. the word captured. Yes. You're not. I'm sorry, it's 37, unfortunately. Um, <coughs> But of course, the, the capture of the information in, isn't in and of itself sufficient, is it? Just merely capturing the information is not going to discharge your obligations? No, not at all. Your, the explanation that you give at, the, at is that that the, all of all that stage of the process is still within, if I can put it this way, still at the dealership, isn't it? The obtaining of that information. Uh, yes, that's correct. And then the next stage, if I can put it that way, you then jump to step, or, or the steps that you explain start at paragraph 45, where you say step 1.1, customer selects a car introduced to a dealer business manager. You see that? Yes. Again, that's within the dealership. Correct. Then 1.2. The dealer business manager will then fill in the customer's application details. You see that? Paragraph 47. The first time that 
Westpac is involved is what you describe at paragraph 52, and that is once certain information is submitted, information from credit reporting bodies in respect of the customer is obtained automatically and using that information and the information entered by the dealer business manager, a credit score is automatically generated for the case. Do you see that? Yes. That's the first involvement that, uh, that Westpac has in this process. Uh, correct. If the case, if it's below a certain threshold, as I understand it, it then goes to a credit team. Is that correct? Um, it, uh, there are a number of thresholds, but yes. Yes. Um, well, your evidence is here, but tell me if there's something that, that I've missed. If the credit score is below a certain threshold or one of the a number of thresholds are not satisfied, the case is referred to the credit team for a manual credit review. That's absolutely correct. Now, if the case, however, meets the necessary thresholds, the case progresses to the auto finance settlements team. That's correct. Now, I'll, you describe that uh, in the form of a a diagram which might assist wbc.103.052.8847 You're familiar with this diagram? Yes. Yeah. Now, I think I've worked it out, but you will tell me if I haven't, Mr. Godkin. The customer is represented at the top, and 1.1 is their application for a car loan. And then if we can go down a little bit, we go to the dealer, and we've dealt with the completing of the loan details. If the system approves the person, if the credit, I'm sorry, if the systems approve, uh, moving from 1.2, system approved, it then goes to an assessing of the application. 1.3 is the first time that we're within Westpac, isn't it? Um. Uh, uh, yes, I, I mean, we're actually in Westpac in that little box above it, but it's the first time a human um, touches it in Westpac. Yes. yes. Uh, sorry, is the yellow, is your point that the yellow is when it says system approved? Yes. Yeah, so that, that's the use of the sovereign system, and if the person's approved, it stays in the dealer. That is to say, it goes then to confirm security and mortgage details, etc., cetera, um, and it stays in the dealer. It only goes into the credit team if the assessment is, is completed uh, and uh, the answer is, is no. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, just to understand, and I understand it was some time ago, but with the case study that we've been dealing with, the breakdown happened at the very first stage, because it should never have, that application should never have got through the Westpac system right at the first stage, should it? Um, I, I, I'm not sure I follow the the um, uh, the, the 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 automatic process yes. um, that we have um, is is not about approval or decline. It's about approve or refer. Correct. Um, so, um, uh, so that that loan application um, was referred at the first hurdle, um, which was the appropriate response at that point. But then it was approved by the credit team inappropriately. You concede. Um, uh, inappropriately. I mean, the the initial. Uh, yes. If you go to 55, 
paragraph 55 of your, state, of your statement. Yes. That deals with circumstances where it's referred for manual credit review. That's correct. And that requires, and that requires checking of various um, information obtained from credit bodies, customers' asset details, etc. Yes. And these are the checks that are done by the credit team, um, and certain checks that are done um, include, um, at paragraph 56, if the customer's declared income is of a certain type, including, for example, where it originates from casual employment, etc. Then the credit team will request supporting documentation. That's correct. Now, if the thresholds are then met, or the credit team gives the go-ahead, then the dealer business manager can go ahead and provide the documents to the, to the customer, if having gone through that process. Correct. However, back when we first went into the Westpac system, if the case meets the necessary thresholds, the case progresses to the auto finance settlements team, doesn't it? That's correct. So it doesn't go through any manual check at all if it passes the, the first stage. Um, it doesn't go through a manual credit assessment. Correct. Um, it does go through a manual compliance check, yes. Yeah. No, the compliance check doesn't happen until later, though, does it? The compliance... Sorry, yes, you're, you're right, yes. Um, once... once, once, he, once sorry, once it gets to the settlements team, that is the start of the manual compliance check. Yes, but by that time, the person's already signed the loan agreement, haven't they? Uh, no, they have not. They have signed an offer. They've signed the offer and then so, the... So they are making the offer. I see. And then that is, to use the example of um, um, the case study, that is what happened a few days after the 26th of July. You'll recall that yes. um, the sale was done on the 26th of July and then the documentation arrived, I think, four days later, I think. Yes. Um, that's the to during that time, if that process was in place at the yeah. time, that's when the compliance check would occur, before that formal document is sent. Well, certainly before it's accepted, yes. yes. But what the settlements team does is what you describe at paragraph 66. Mm -hmm. And I think... And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a very different process to that which is done by the manual credit review team, isn't it? Yes, completely. Um, in fact, the check is really to ensure that the offer application direct debit requests have been executed. Do you see that? Uh, I do, yes. Uh, that there's sufficient documentation to verify the information <laughs> entered on the, the sovereign system. Yes. Um, and then the know your customer requirements and then there's also um, a check for the add-on insurance policies. We'll return to that issue mm -hmm. later. Sure. So that, in a case that goes through the automated process, the only things that are done are the checks that I've just referred to in paragraph 66. Uh, there's also an income verification step yeah, in, and in the settlement state. It, it in 67, that checks, that's the check of the income. Correct. At that point. Yeah. And that's, that's what you just, you've described as the compliance check, is that right? Well, it's the combination of um, that, the ID checks, and the um, uh, might be the security check at the same time, yeah. But at 66B, there's reference to the income check by the settlements team. Sufficient documentation oh, provided to verify information 
entered into sovereign, including in particular documents evidencing yes. income. Yes, thank you. Yes. Nothing about expenses? Uh, correct. You'd agree that some positive steps to verify the information provided by the consumer are required? I'm sorry? You'd, you'd agree with me that some positive steps to verify the information provided by the consumer is required? Um, in, um, in some cases... Uh, well, are there cases in which... Are there cases in which it's unnecessary for any positive steps to be taken by Westpac to verify the information given to you by your consumer? Um, I think that there are cases where reasonable inquiries wouldn't require more positive steps depending on the nature of the customer. Um, which is not not to include income verification, but well, you've you've said that there's no checks of expenses. That's correct. So, and, the, and there is no circumstances where we would not do income verification. I see. How long has that been the process? Sorry, which the process of all, of checking in, um, income, Mr. Uh, Godkin? Uh, for as long as I know, um, broadly and. In those circumstances where it hasn't occurred, such as the study we've been talking mm -hmm. about, um, you can't any, offer any explanation for why that occurred? Um, no, I can't in those circumstances, no. But can we bring it back to this, Mr God? Can, can you point to any stage in the process where expenditure is checked or verified? Um, so, as, as I said earlier, um, in the vast majority of cases, expenditure is not verified. Um, Therefore, the if the dealer business manager records that the uh, borrower is living rent free with a relative, that just goes through um, so without the, check. Um, so the practice at the time um, of the case study is that that would have just gone through without check. I mean, there was a notation on the application saying that it was boarding. Um, the practice today um, is that that would get picked up by an undisclosed minimum. Um, built into the system which would refer it to the credit team with a flag that that was um, what had referred it, um, which would um, require them to make further inquiries. Now, those inquiries may or may not rise to the level of some form of verification, but it would at least prompt. If the dealer does not record, the dealer business manager does not record that the would-be borrower has dependents, there is no part of the system that would pick that up, is there? Um, there is um, not. I mean, there's a separate question that we now force the dealer manager, sorry, the business manager through, but um, there's not an independent verification of that other than, again, um, and uh, it's picked up in the, in the document that we referred to earlier in relation to the quality assurance um, program, which specifically talks about how people might think about um, uh, uh, assessing um, dependence, uh, using that as an example, and, and if through that monitoring um, there were issues, then that would be fed back to the um, credit team. And if the dealer business manager records that the would-be borrower has no dependence, the hem that is taken to account in assessing household living expenses is less than uh, the amount that would be taken to account uh, if the number of dependents were truly recorded? In, in those circumstances, yes. Yeah. Are you familiar with the ASIC regulatory uh, guideline 209? Uh, yes, I am. Um, I might call that up. Mm -hmm. RCD.0021.0001.0088. <coughs> and Westpac would consider the guidelines represent good practice? Mr Godkin? I, I can't comment on... I'm sorry? I, I can't comment on that. I um, can't comment on that. I, um, 
well, it is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> if you go, have spoken, and that's it. <laughs> if you go to point o one o seven, page twenty, of the document, which will be coming up for you now. Yeah. Paragraph 209.46. You are obliged to take reasonable steps to verify consumers' financial situation. Do you see that? Yes. Generally, this will require some positive steps to verify the information provided by the consumer. As discussed earlier, what constitutes taking reasonable steps to verify information is generally scalable and what amounts to reasonable verification will depend on information and resources that you have access to and the facts and circumstances of each case. Okay. There's no distinction drawn there, is there, between income and expenses? Uh, not specifically, no. If you go to um, page 0 0.0121, um, paragraph 209.93, Having completed reasonable inquiries, you must assess whether the credit contract or consumer lease is not unsuitable, which includes assessing whether the consumer can meet their financial obligations under the contract without substantial hardship. Skipping ahead, this assessment will be based on the information you obtained and verified when you made reasonable inquiries about the consumer's financial situation. It's still... It's still your position, or it was your evidence previously that you rely on the information that the dealers in this regard? Um, there, there is a significant portion um, of the financial um, uh, circumstances where we rely on the combination of the customer declaration and the business manager um, declaration. Of course, there are other parts of the financial circumstances where we rely on independent verification, which goes to pay slips, for example. Isn't a problem for Westpac the fact that its reliance on dealers is such that whatever its contractual <coughs> arrangements with the dealers, the dealers themselves aren't subject to the National Credit Act? Um, uh, so. so that's a factor, but which is why it's so important that the framework that I talked about previously um, is effective. Um, well, in many ways, the obligations on Westpac are greater, aren't they, in those circumstances? <coughs> I, I don't know that they're greater. I think they're more challenging. Um, so, um, you know, we have the same responsibilities if we're working with a... Um, a directly employed distribution force. The, 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 the reality is we're working with a not employed distribution force, so we need to have extra capability in place to monitor and to create consequences. Well, it's a not employed distribution force that has an incentive to make the sale and close the deal. That is also true. Including uh, make the sale of the loan. Um, that, that is true. Because they get a commission if they do. That's correct. Yeah. Just returning to that question of um, remuneration um, and, and, and commission, is it right yeah. that um, is it right that the dealer also gets an origination fee? Uh, that is correct. Yes. How much is that at the moment? Um, I don't, I, I, I'm going to say um, it's in the order of 400, no, no, $700, I think, but I, actually, actually, I don't know. But it's Ms. in. Ms. Mm -hmm. Vangadam, I think she paid 500 back in 2012. That, that, that would make sense. 
Um, um, so, so and, it's, and it's probably, you know, it'll be something a bit more expensive than that now, but I don't know the exact number. One of the things that I didn't deal with when I went to the remuneration, is it, is it true that um, the dealer also um, is paid a direct debit bonus? Uh, in some cases. What does that mean? So that means, um, and, and this is quite an odd business and some things have kind of lasted for a long time, but at a time when direct debit was not so common, um, uh, the business um, created a specific incentive uh, for um, dealers to get customers who they had originated onto a direct debit payment um, process. And how much is that bonus, do you know? Uh, I, I don't. It's not, it's not very much in the scheme of things. I fear that doesn't convey a great deal to me, Mr. Godkin, if you can give me... I, I know you don't know the exact numbers, but, again, order of magnitude? Um, Are we talking hundreds of dollars or...? Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, don't sure, know. I'm sure we can provide the data. I was, I'm not trying to... Yeah. But I don't no, no, know. No, it's not a memory test, yeah. but it's still provided. It's still, yes, it's still. It's just a, a legacy. Um, Why not cut it? Uh, it it's a good question. It's because it's tiny and insignificant. It, it was you know, included for completeness. But um, a, a, as we go through the process this year towards the implementation of Flex, it will give us the opportunity to tidy up um, you know, some very old legacy structures. I mean, whatever the amount might be, it's another cost to the consumer, isn't it? Um, ultimately, the price is that all of the costs added up plus a margin, yeah. Now, in your evidence, you say that Westpac monitors the car loan portfolio through a number of monitoring practices, is that right? Uh, that's correct. The chief monitoring practices relate to a number of specific areas of concern? Uh, yes. What are the main areas of concern so, for Westpac? Um, so the... Um, so, so, so the chief, like the, the principal monitoring um, uh, has been around um, uh, interest rate cap monitoring, just to make sure that that's not um, breached, um, uh, add-on insurance um, monitoring in relation to some specific limits that we've got around add-on insurance. It's become a little bit less relevant because we've systemised some of those limits so that it's a hard stop. Um, um, the sales um, practice quality assurance monitoring, which is the document that we've talked to um, earlier, which will range from, you know, potential responsible lending issues to potential add-on insurance issues to, um, uh, you know, potential dealer misconduct issues. I mean, it's quite broad um, in its um, scope. Um, customer call monitoring, which goes directly to... Um, uh, you know, questions around whether the dealer business manager is having the right conversation um, with the customer across a range of different um, elements of the conversation that we expect them to have. Um, credit review monitoring, which goes more specifically to what that credit acceptance team does, and, and a big part of that is their adherence to the credit um, policy, but it will take into account other elements that are more broad as um, well. Um, and then the you know, we have monitoring over the settlements team who are responsible for that compliance function that we talked to earlier. So it's quite, it is quite broad ranging. The, f the first two that you identified, interest rate cap monitoring and add-on insurance monitoring, I think it's mm. fair to say that those are issues that um, can potentially have detrimental effects on, on customers, is that right? Uh, the most significant detrimental effects on customers? Um, uh, in, in some circumstances, I think that's, I think that's right. I think uh, 
is it of is it a matter of concern to you is it a matter of concern to you that and this is dealing with something with I have asked some questions about already, but I want to take you to a particular document. Mm -hmm. Is it a matter of concern that dealers might be out there uh, encouraging uh, people to purchase at the highest possible interest rate to increase their to increase their return? That is their um, their commission at the end of the month. Yes, of course. Uh, and you deal with this, don't you, in one of the um, training um, code of conduct and customer fairness outcome documents. I might take you to PG1 C6. Yes. WBC.300.001.65 yes. And if you go to 6577 Down the bottom, it says general conduct obligations. We've talked about those. They are the section 47 obligations, although you have had put them here um, for the purposes of discussion with the dealers. And the first dot point is have adequate arrangements in place to ensure our customers are not disadvantaged by any conflict of interest that may arise wholly or partly in relation to the credit activities. Correct. And, and we've talked about that. The example that's given is, for example, this means you should not suggest or recommend a product to a customer purely based on the amount of commission or remuneration that will be received. Do you see that? Yes. Um, does that occur commonly, do you think? Um, I can't say how commonly that occurs. Well, I think we've acknowledged, um, and it's been part of our conversation um, today, that um, there is a um, there is um, a pricing structure in this market which raises potential conflicts um, and I've got no doubt from time to time people take advantage of that conflict. Thank you. Can I ask you now um, a few questions about um, add-on insurance? Please. Um, what is add-on insurance? Um, so add-on insurance um, refers to, um, in, in very general terms, yes. it, it refers to insurance uh, which is often sold at um, a point of sale that will be add-on to the, it's referred to as add-on because it's add-on to the um, principal purpose of the transaction, which in this case might, is um, you know, purchasing a motor vehicle. Um, in relation to um, motor vehicle transactions, it typically does not include um, comprehensive um, insurance when you talk about add-on. Um, so it might include um, products like, oh sorry, it does include products like uh, consumer um, credit insurance, um, uh, tire and rim, tire and rim uh, gap insurance or some form of shortfall insurance and, um, and, and in some cases mechanical insurance. Yeah. Um, Am I right to say that it's a very profitable aspect of the car loan business, add-on insurance? Uh, no, you're not. Um, so for the car loan business, um, so specifically for our business, um, uh, it's, it, you know, the most recent numbers is it's 1.5% it's, it's of the value of loans um, that we write. Um, and, and in fact, it's because we do have... Um, you know, monitoring and compliance and accreditation issues in that part of our business is expensive to run. The, well, perhaps if I could just explore with you what um, some of the problems are with, um, with add-on insurance. Yes. Um, last week the Commission heard evidence from um, from a Ms Karen Cox of the Financial Rights Legal Centre. She mm -hmm. gave some evidence. You do. Um, I, I don't know if you um, saw that or, or read about her evidence. Um, I did. It's a, it feels like a while ago now, but yes. Yes, it, it certainly <laughs> does. Uh, Ms Cox noted that add-on insurance has been highlighted in recent years in a number of inquiries. has been a focus of ASIC's attention. She was right to do so, wasn't she? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you'd agree... Um, You'd also agree that um, 
that, or you'd be familiar with um, ASIC's report on add-on insurance um, last year, a market that is failing consumers, the sale of add-on insurance through car dealers? Yes, I am. Um, Ms Cox spoke about some of her experiences where consumers are sold products they don't realise they have and cannot recall consenting to purchasing. Yes. Do you have any views on that? Um, I have a view that that's an inappropriate outcome, yes. Um, there's, she referred to high pressure sales tactics that are used. Do you have any personal knowledge of those? Um, I, I don't. I understand ASIC's um, you know, concerns, which I think she was reflecting, but yes. Um, and references to um, you know, wearing people down with a long sales process and suggesting that the consumer needs to buy the product? Um, needs to buy the add-on product as part of the car purchase? Um, yeah, so I'm aware of the t her testimony and ASIC's similar findings. Do you add, are you able to assist by any experience of that yourself? So, uh, so, so I don't have um, specific examples that, I can, that I'm aware of where that's, um, that's been the case, so no. Um, are you familiar that another concern that's been expressed is that unsuitable sales um, are made where a consumer could never actually claim because of their personal circumstances? I certainly am. Yes. Um, um, and that the benefits, even if someone can claim, are very limited? Uh, in some cases, yes, I believe that's the case. Now, I think I put the question to you before, perhaps, um, um, in an ill-advised way. When I said that it is very profitable, am I right to say that it is... Um, who would you, in your evidence, who is it? Pro, is it profitable for anyone? Add-on insurance. Um, historically, um, uh, it has been an important source of income for dealers, um, and I can't speak to insurance company profitability, but um. Have the dealers got the income. What, in the form of commission? Uh, that's correct. And commission at uh, what sort of rate or level? Um, so ASIC has re um, referred to commissions at around 50%, if not higher, um, going back a few years. Of course, that's changed, but they're still around 20 now. It's, I think capped at, is it 20 or 25? Not, I understand it's not actually capped, but the industry has moved to a, um, 20 or thereabouts. Yes. It's been a matter of considerable concern and litigation in the UK and yes. other contexts, hasn't it? Yes. Yeah. I take you to... <coughs> um, I'm a document in relation to this issue, if I may. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it is... Um, again, this is a private screen document, WBC.040.034.6513. Perhaps I can um, put it to you in... Now, is this a document that... Uh, uh, ..can be displayed publicly, Mr Sheehan? I'm just checking, can this forgive me? Not immediately apparent to me why not, but there we are. So um, I agree with, immediately with your observation. Um, the only thing that is causing some hesitation here is that I don't think we had, I don't think we had noticed that this was going to be relied upon. So we haven't checked the rest of it. 
But if no, I, but this page is all I'm fussed about at the moment. We'll page is fine. slice the onion very thinly, I think, if we may, Mr Sheehan. So uh, we can display this publicly? Yes. Yes. Sorry to keep you waiting. Mr Godkin, um, this document is a memorandum... Record to of the latest regulatory report. It's not a deep, dark trade secret to Westpac, perhaps. Um, it's a memorandum Maybe to... Maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a memorandum to the CEO of your organisation, is that right? Uh, that's correct. Uh, and all I'm taking you to, and I apologise for the delay, um, in getting to this point, but the, under the heading, the latest regulatory report, mm -hmm. um, there is a discussion of um, insurance products and the key findings were um, these. Consumers receive much less in claims than dealers receive in, in commissions. Yes. Is that right in your experience? Um, I, do, I, don't, I don't have the experience to answer that. Um, and there's a reference which I would like to deal with, um, with you, which is F&I income, which I think is finance and insurance. Mm, correct. Finance and insurance income is consistently reporting 80 to 120% of dealer profits. What, what's meant by, by that? Um, so... Um, uh, so, so dealers, um, and, and, and I should um, make the point, so when I talk about dealers, you know, my experience is with new car franchise groups, um, so which doesn't mean they don't do used cars, but it's, um, uh, you know, the, the dealer customers that we have are um, in some way associated with a brand franchise that they're selling new cars for. So, so, so what I'm about to say relates to that cohort of um, for, for dealers. Um, uh, um, and some broad numbers um, which are based on some industry work. Um, some broad numbers based on some um, industry work which has been conducted by the AADA which is the, I don't know. Australian Automotive Dealers Association. Um, uh, so dealers earn about 1.9% of um, sales um, as profit. Um, um, but as a rough guide, um, um, on, in, on average, more than 100% of that net amount that they make um, is equivalent to the income that they earn from finance and insurance activities. So in, so in other words, if it weren't for finance and insurance activities, um, there are a lot of dealers out there who would be losing money. I gather that's why, and I won't take you to this page, but I'll read it to you. Mm -hmm. That's why Mr Lindbergh, um, the Chief Executive of Business Bank, went on to say, um, um, and we don't need to go to it, but mm -hmm. uh, there's a summary that he gives at the end of this memo, and he says, however, it should be noted that the combined effect of finance and insurance changes are likely to substantially erode the profitability of the motor vehicle dealership model and the physical point of sale model that we are heavily committed to. Yes. So, add on insurance, um, whatever might be its uh, vices, it's um, a part of the, um, that model to which Mr Lindbergh was referring uh, that's an important part of it from the dealers. For, for the dealers, it is, um, has, has historically been an important part of their profitability, yes. Um, and what has Westpac been doing about, doing about, um, about the issue of add-on insurance um, to deal with this issue? Yeah, so... Um, if I might, I might just say that um, any comments I make in relation to add-on insurance are very focused on the involvement of the auto finance business in funding... That, that, that's what you're here for. ..in, in funding add-on in, insurance. So, um, uh, and, and so then I might also say that um, our role in this industry is to fund... Um, uh, the requirements that a customer has, and that includes the motor vehicle and any 
um, other things that they're financing and some of those are add-on insurance. So we don't actually sell um, add-on insurance, but we do um, no, I, uh, uh, finance it. Sorry, fine, yeah. um, that said, um, uh, we have put some steps in place um, to um, uh, mitigate the risk of potential mis-selling um, in this marketplace. Um, and they include um, a um, more comprehensive and robust accreditation process for um, add-on insurance products which are available for financing. Um, and that will include a review of the PDS um, with a view to um, clarity of um, exclusions um, with a um, view to um, any potential overlap that may um, exist between different types of policies um, uh, with a view to um, exploring whether there is any life insurance um, component um, on the basis that we will no longer finance CCI with a life insurance um, component. Uh, and then finally, um, with a view to any real prospect um, of benefit. So we would typically see, see from the insurance company now um, some estimate of the payout ratio, for example, which is part of that consideration um, process. Um, we use an external party who's actually an insurance expert, because we are not, um, to do some assessment for us. And that, combined with some additional information, um, which, would include, um, which would include, for example, commission rates, um, is considered before we will accredit a product um, available for um, financing. Again, we don't sell it, we only finance it. In addition to that, um, we have um, capped the aggregate amount of insurance premium that we will fund relative to the level um, of the, or the value of the vehicle. Um, and we have capped the amount of equity um, that a customer can have in a vehicle and have um, gap insurance um, appropriate. So in other words, if you have too much and the number is 25%. If you're over 25% equity, it's unlikely the gap insurance would confer a benefit if the vehicle was written off. The, Does that make sense? Um, as I understand it, and this, what you're referring to is now part of your credit policy, as I understand it. It's the, the total amount finance relating to adult insurance must not be greater than 25% of the total amount finance. Is that right? Um, so that's one part of it, yes. Yes, that was the one you referred to first, I think. That's correct, yes. yes. Um, Although 25% can still be quite a considerable amount uh, for customers, can it not? Um, it, it, it could be indeed, yes, depending on the... Yes, it could be. Uh, uh, can I take you to WBC? Are we doing something with this page? Yes, I'm tendering that, uh, Commissioner. Thank Exhibit you. 1.146, I think. Uh, page from Memorandum to CEO Westpac. Banking Corporation dated uh, the 22nd <laughs> of July 2000. Oh, no, I've got the wrong one. Bear with me. What dates? Just scroll down or up, I should say. Um, 22 September 2016. 22nd September uh, 2016, WBC 04003465106510. Commissioner, you'll re recall that I referred to the third page, but I, under oh, that yeah. I understand. So it's what page number? I might seek subject to my learned friend. Commissioner, the, the whole document can go in because the part that's confidential is already the essentiality order. Uh, so. Uh, the exhibit becomes, does it, Memorandum to CEO Westpac Banking Corporation, 22 September 16, WBC 04003465510, and that's exhibit 1.146. Thank you. Uh, can I take you to a memo to the Board Risk and Compliance Committee, WBC.200.004.2548, Dot two five four eight. Unfortunately, that's two five four eight. Unfortunately, that's private screen two. But I shall. Uh, 
nine. Which one is it? Um, and sorry, can we go to point two five five six, please? Thank you. Um, and I'll hand a copy to you. So this is a memo to the Board Risk and Compliance Committee, dated, you'll remind me of the date, I'm sorry. Uh, 24th of April, 2017. Now, your evidence previously was that there's been a number of changes made in relation to add-on insurance. Um, the, what was put in this um, memo to the committee of the board was uh, that um, ASIC, which is doing some, um, which has had some concerns about add on insurance, um, we responded on 16 February 2017 that Westpac will continue to finance, finance add on insurance when appropriate, but we have taken a nuanced approach and have stopped financing certain products. What do you mean by a nuanced approach? Um, so, uh, not, my, not my document, not my, not my words. Um, Sorry, what do you... Well, uh, um, if, if I, uh, how do you... If I can, so, so ASIC, um, uh, ASIC approached um, Westpac um, with a very specific request, which is, um, you know, would you stop financing um, add-on insurance? Um, our approach um, was um, not a um, no. It was um, there are some things that we can do in relation to add-on insurance which we will help, sorry, which we think will help um, you and the industry um, uh, mitigate the risk of um, mis-selling and get better value back in the hands um, of the customer. And, and they include some of those things that I talked about earlier. What's the position with this page, Mr. Chair? That, that page is on the screen and there's no objection to it. Um, yes, it should go up then. Okay. But the position, um, the West, and Westpac's position remains that it does um, continue to finance add-on insurance, mm. but subject to the, um, the the policies that you referred to previously. Is that right? Um, yes, absolutely. Is there anything else? One point one four seven will be a page from the Board Risk and Compliance Committee, twenty four April seventeen WBC two hundred zero zero four at two five five six. Mr. Donnelly, how long do you expect to be with Mr. Godcom? I, th um, I think Mr. Godcom will be happy to hear that I'm just about finished. Can I just have one moment, oh, yeah, Commissioner? I, um, it was a question, not an inter interrogative uh, and statement, I'm despite what you thought. <laughs> uh, can we, at least for the moment, reasonably confidently proceed and finish Mr. Godcom tonight, or, is, or am I trying to... Uh, go a bridge too far. What do you think, Mr. Shaw? I, th I think we can finish him tonight. If uh, it would be better if we could finish him, so Let go on. Thank uh, you. Yes. I'm at the start, you gave some evidence about um, <coughs> uh, Ms. Thiravanga Dam's experience. Yes, indeed. And It appear, uh, is it fair to say that the experience that she had was not an isolated one in the experience of, of Westpac? Um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's fair to say that there will be other examples, yes. Uh, there are, you've, you've accepted that there are co conflicts between uh, dealers uh, what uh, dealers in their duties, sorry, you've accepted that 
um, there is a conflict between what dealers are doing and uh, the, the, the consumer when it comes to the particular remuneration of, of dealers? So, um, at, the, at the risk of slightly restating, so, so I've accepted that um, the remuneration structure in this market um, is both inappropriate, I think is the word that I used, and creates the, um, the risk of conflict, yes. Um, and it's a risk that, uh, or a conflict that's, uh, that remains in existence to this day? Yes, it does. Now, you've given evidence as to some improvements, in particular since, um, uh, since November 2016, mm -hmm. that have been made um, uh, at Westpac, but I think it was your evidence that before that, there was a recognition that um, the process has needed improvement. There was, there was opportunity for improvement, certainly, yes. Uh, and, but one policy that hasn't been amended over the course of the last six years, as I understand it, has been the remuneration policy for dealers, has it? Uh, absent that um, cap um, that we introduced in... Um, Sorry, that's right. Um, you're absolutely correct. That is between 2012 and 2018. Aside from that cap, the remuneration of dealers has remained the same. Absolutely. Anything else? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Godkin. Mr. Didn't our leaders, any party other than Westpac, seek leave to cross examine Mr. Godkin? No, very well. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Godkin, you were asked some questions about. Um, uh, payments in respect of direct debit sign-ups? Yes. And I'm just going to ask you, give you some figures and see if they jog your recollection as to the order of magnitude. You're going to give evidence from the bar table, Mr Sheehan, to what council is paid to do. Go on. It'll only be evidence if he agrees, right? <laughs> um, that um, they're, they're tiered according to the percentage of contracts that the uh, dealer is able to get onto a direct debit arrangement. That, that sounds familiar. And the, and the range is from $7.50 per contract up to $20 per contract. Uh, uh, sadly, that I don't recall, but... Don't recall. Right. We'll have some evidence directed <laughs> to it, Commissioner, in due course. Um, well, Mr Godkin... Uh, if, if that's what Westpac says it is, that's what Westpac says it is. It, it is what we say it is. Yes. Thank you, Mr Sheehan. Now, um, you were asked uh, a little earlier today about... Mm -hmm. um, ASIC's media release uh, in relation to its Flex Commission's uh, study, and um, you mentioned that there had been some consultation papers issued. Uh, Westpac responded to consultation papers issued yep. by ASIC. Yes, it did. Can you have a look at this, please? Uh, WBC.104.003.2122. <coughs> if that can be brought up. Let's see if I read it out and read it out incorrectly. WBC 104003 All right. I'll, we'll have the, doc, the document doesn't seem to be on the system. I thought it was. We'll tender it in due course. Uh, as it's self-explanatory. Uh, but in short, what was Westpac's position in dealing with ASIC as to what should happen to flex commissions in the industry? Um, sorry, just, just so I'm clear, so the position that um, Westpac shared with ASIC yes. um, uh, is that we should um, uh, remove the link um, between price and commission completely. Thank you. Now, ASIC's... Um, Sorry, when you refer to price and commission, you mean... I mean a complete prohibition of flex commission. Yes. A complete prohibition. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, ASIC's um, uh, consultations with the industry about this went back a few years before 2016, is that right? 
Um, yes. All right. And uh, if you have a look at this, I'll see if I can get this one right. <laughs> WBC.103.001.4629. It's not there. Um, well, we'll tender that in due course. Now, Mr. Godkin. You um, said in answer to the Commissioner earlier today that uh, in relation to Mrs Thiruvang loan mm -hmm. that there were two different credit officers who approved it over a couple of submissions. Yes. Do you recall giving that evidence? Can um, the witness be shown Exhibit 1.139 uh, WBC.104.003.7572 Seven five seven three. This was only tendered today, so that will explain why he doesn't have it. Do you have a copy? I wanted to call bingo if you get one now, <laughs> Mr. Shield. <laughs> if, if I get one now, I'll deserve bingo. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the writing on, on that is very small, Mr. Godkin, but are these, you recognise that these are screen, screenshots from the uh, sovereign system in relation to uh, Mrs. Theravandrican? Yes, I do. And if you look at the second page, which is 7573, does that enable you to identify who the two officers were involved in the approval of her loan? Uh, so, uh, Varun Pinto and Lavina Pavira. Right, thank you. Are the two officers. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm struggling to read that. And um, finally, I think, uh, you were asked some questions about the 2017 compliance assessment in relation to her loan, it became exhibit uh, 1.143, WBC.300.003.8179. And you recall saying um, that you took the language in that document to mean that there had been uh, failures in the application of the credit policy? Yes. All right. Now, um, have there nevertheless been some changes in the credit policy uh, relevant to uh, the circumstances of the complainant? Um, indeed, so specifically um, in relation to the case study. Um, uh, the, at the time in 2012, um, um, the fact that um, she was receiving a carer's allowance um, from Centrelink um, was um, available for a credit officer um, to approve. Um, today, um, because it's um, not on the acceptable um, income list, it's therefore deemed unacceptable, so you would not approve the loan um, on that basis. Um, in addition to that... Just before you leave that, I may well have forgotten this. I thought she was on uh, family benefits rather than a carer's benefit, but perhaps I'm mistaken. There's a, there's a complex series of components to her Centrelink. Yes, I think is the answer, yeah. Commissioner. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the the second key change, I think, is, is it relates to the case study, is that um, a much tighter level of requirements in terms of when a credit officer can um, approve a credit um, that has um, what we refer to as a low side override, which is where the credit score has not met the hurdle um, in that initial um, automatic um, process, and because. Um, in this case, the customer um, was not an A-rated existing um, St George customer or indeed a homeowner. Um, she would not qualify. So, um, so there would be no way of getting her through the current policies? No, indeed. When were the changes made um, to those policies? Uh, 
Okay. Do you mind if I just refer to my... Of statement? course not. Yeah, so. Of course you should. Right, so. Of course you should. So I think these are dealt with in paragraph 52 of your second statement. Um, Mr. Gordon. Oh, sorry, you might... Uh, so the case study statement. Um, so... You, you don't have a date there for the change in paragraph A... In paragraph B, you refer to a change in August 2016. Um, yes, yeah, so the second of the things I talked about was August um, 2016. Um, and I don't specifically know the date. Again, we can provide it. I can search back through the change history and the credit policy to find it eventually. But No further questions. Yes, questions. thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Right, Mr. Gold could be excused. Yeah, is there anything, Mr. Donnelly? No. No. Uh, thank you, Mr. Godkin. Yes, welcome. you're excused. Further attendance. Thank you. Uh, 9.45 tomorrow morning.